Welcome to the Ask a Cycling Coach podcast presented by Trainer Road. Today, we are going to talk about training fatigue. Like, what, what, how do you recognize it? What to do when it starts to creep up on you? And maybe the decisions, most importantly, the decisions that led into it. So then we can all get a better fix on when it happens and how to avoid it. We're going to talk about motivation. We're going to talk about recovery. Uh, but we also, first things first here, uh, pretty exciting. We have uh, Pivot Cycles and DT Swiss's Hannah Otto with us. Hannah, you raced. Uh, two races, I think over the past weekend, a short track and cross country mm-hmm. Olympic down in San Diego, uh, UCI race. So you've got, um, Kate Courtney, Gwen Gibson. We've got you, we've got Haley Batten. We've got like, it's a, it's a Maddie Monroe, really heavy hitter field, uh, for here in the States. So what did you learn racing short track and then also racing XCO with them? Yeah, this was our first big UCI race in the States. So the way I was viewing this was this was kind of, even though I'd raced in Puerto Rico already, this was kind of that transition from preseason to now we are full on in season. So the first thing was, you know, you train all winter and you want to know, like, is it transferring to the races? Right. (laughs) So I think the first thing I really learned was I gained a lot of confidence in my training. I think the trajectory for the season looks good. Um, I actually felt really strong in all the races, which was awesome. Um, I felt super in control and, you know, hindsight's 2020 would have, could have, should have, like, that's the whole point in racing. Um, but looking back, I'm like, Oh, if only I had done this and if only I had done this, maybe I could have finished even higher. Um, Mm. so I was fourth in both races. And so in hindsight, looking back, I think a lot of that was tactics. Um, so a couple of very specific things I learned with tactics. The first one was short track was, um, about 45 seconds in a wide, wide open area. And then another minute that was all single track. So there was no passing. So that 45 Mm -hmm. seconds was really the place where you had to make it happen. Um, and so that made for a me a little bit anxious at least. And so I think I made two significant mistakes there. The first was there was one time, um, well, I I guess they actually kind of went together. So one time I was coming down the single track and I was actually leading and I was looking back as the single track was snaking. And I thought, wow, it is really strung out, you know, because if you have a group of 10 people and you're all lined up, that 10th wheel is pretty far back. You're like 20 seconds behind at that point. Exactly. And so in my mind, my thought in that moment and the excitement was the second I come out of this corner, I'm just going to carry speed and I'm going to attack really hard. Um, And that is, that was not the move because I was on the front already. And I know we talk about this a lot in crits, um, but maybe you don't think about it as much on the mountain bike is you don't want to attack from the front of the group. And so even though that group was strung out and even though that 10th person was 20 seconds back, they had a direct line to my wheel. So not only did I burn matches, unnecessary matches in that attack. I mean, it was like 20 seconds at 600 Watts, which for me, that's a, a pretty solid attack um, yeah, for, for big people and, too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, dang. yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, you know, I burned a lot of matches and I didn't gain any ground because it was just strung out. So that was probably my biggest mistake in short track. Um, and then I think in XCO, you know, basically what happened was we started, I, uh, wanted to be a little bit more conservative on the start two girls got off the front early because it was in single track and there was someone who wasn't descending quite as strong. So they got a little bit of a gap um, and they were off the front. And so then I was in a position where I needed to be able to bridge that gap somehow, but I didn't want to carry everyone with me because it was really, really windy. Um, And I tried on a couple different places to attack. And I just, even though I felt like I was the strongest, I was not bridging. I was not gaining the ground that I wanted to gain. And so as the race was going on, I was thinking, gosh, what am I doing wrong? Even though I feel so strong in this group, why can I not close this gap? And I think it was because I was attacking in all the wrong places. I was attacking in the most difficult places in the course. They were also really short lived. And so people could gut it out in these short 30 second climbs. So I was trying to attack. And finally, on the last lap, it occurred to me, I need to attack where it's unexpected, where I have a long amount of time to gain this. And so finally I attacked it on a place in the course where I had 
about a three minute climb that was super gradual. It wasn't expected. It gave me a lot of time to string it out. Um, and that's how I was ultimately able to get that gap in order to finish fourth. But I think if I had executed that earlier, if I'd figured out that place earlier, that would have given me the chance I needed to break away and then try and bridge that gap earlier in the race. Mm. This is uh, the thought that comes, this is really cool. You know, the, you know, the saying like the juice is worth the squeeze sort of a thing. Like mm -hmm. you're trying to like get as much as you can for a certain action. And that's a really good point with attacks thinking about where is a spot where I can, because if you attack in technical sections, then you have to slow down. You're governed by something. So where's a spot where I don't have to be governed where an attack exactly. can actually have the most impact. That's a really cool concept. I, I haven't really thought of it directly like that in mountain biking before, but that's smart. Really cool. Yeah. Yeah. So we'll see. I'm going to Fayetteville for the next UCI races um, this coming week. So I'll have a chance to try it all over again. Sweet. Uh, and Hannah, everybody should go follow Hannah on Instagram so then they can check that out. Uh, that'd be awesome. Sorry, Ivy, go ahead. It sounds so stressful being on a course like that where you just have to go bonkers for like 45 seconds. And then the rest part where you want to rest, you can't feels like, or sounds like you can't really rest in those technical single track sections. Like you have to be on the whole time. Sounds exhausting. I, yeah. <laughs> I do think it's really stressful because you have this whole course that you have to be on for yet you find yourself on the start line, like, oh my gosh, the next 30 seconds of this hour and a half race are going to dictate so much. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's an important thing for everyone to know who does XCO racing is when the course gives you opportunity to pass and then gives you a, a single track or a place where you can't pass, you do have to take that into consideration with your strategy and take advantage of those passing opportunities. Uh, Hannah, you had good results, but Kevin, an, a person who wrote in at trainroad.com slash podcast, didn't have a good result and he's wondering why uh, we should get into it. We also have our CEO, Nate Pearson with us. Uh, good to have you, Nate. So, uh, Kevin says, I started my race career as a way to recover from a hip replacement at the age of 44. I became instantly hooked when I took second place at the sea otter classic in my first ever race. It was cross country Olympic, which Sea Otter, to be clear, isn't the typical cross-country Olympic race. Like it's more, um, it's faster, more wide open, and it's one big loop instead of doing repeated laps like what Hannah was just talking about. And uh, Kevin mentions that they raced Cat 3, which in mountain biking, for those that don't know, that's the beginning category. Um, that's the one where you start out. So uh, Kevin goes on to say, as I've continued to race and advance to Cat 2, I've come to realize that a podium result is more the expectation and less the rule. Here I am, meaning that it's tricky to do <laughs> when you move up in the category. Here I am five years later, still racing Cat 2 and Cross Country Olympic and Cat 1 in a local short track series. I know expecting a podium finish is not a sustainable way to race, so I've adjusted my expectations, but I still find myself less motivated to race and at times discouraged by my results. As a result, my race day mental game is suffering. I recently quit a short track race midway, midway through, even though I could have persevered to the finish. So what mental tricks do other racers use to stay sharp and focused at the start and through a race, even though they aren't a race favorite or don't have a chance at a podium or a top 10 in larger fields? Great question, uh, Kevin. Uh, Hannah, maybe we start uh, with you, then we go to Ivy. And then Nate, you can share some thoughts on this too. <laughs> I think I'm the only one that actually has this. Everyone else podiums all the time. <laughs> <laughs> that is not true. Absolutely not. <laughs> More than me. <laughs> Yeah, ahead, I now. think I think this is a great question. And, you know, when I first started in the pro field, a podium was way out of the realm of possibility for me. Even standing on the start line, I knew I would not podium on that day. And if I had given in to that early on in my career, I wouldn't be where I am now. And it would have been discouraging in that sort of trajectory upward. And so I think there's two things that really helped me on that journey. The first is focusing on your pro process and performance goals. So process goals are things that you have complete control over. Um, that could be your nutrition throughout the race, um, that could be warming up really well. It's things that 
exactly like the word is, the process. Um, so first focus on knocking all of those out. The next are performance goals. Those are still things that you have control over, um, but it's more say power oriented. So you might not be able to achieve it. It's a little bit further outside the realm, but it doesn't involve other people. So focus on things like I'm gonna hold X amount of power on this climb. Um, or I'm going to hold this amount of power for the first lap, or my times are only going to decrease 10% across the whole race, or my power is only going to decrease 10% in the second half of the race, whatever it might be. Um, those are your performance goals. And then when you finish, even if you don't podium, you can look back and say, you know, I wasn't on the podium, but I did every single thing that was within my control to try and get there. So I don't actually have an excuse to be disappointed because I achieved everything that I thought I could on the start line. And then you almost force that happiness. The second thing is just because you're not on the podium doesn't mean you can't have a good result for you. And I think a good result is just defined by an improvement. So if you were 20th last week, don't focus on being on the podium next week. Just focus on being higher than 20th. Um, and that can be your victory. That can be your win. And so I would start looking at where you're finishing in this field and just focus on being a little bit further up every race. And who knows, you might surprise yourself and a podium might become something you get in the future. Nice. Good stuff. Uh, how about you, Ivy? I was just thinking how much of a kind of curse it is to have success right away uh, when you first start <laughs> racing, right? And then it <laughs> becomes maybe not an expectation, but like, you know what it tastes like to do well. And, and then, you know, you want to keep, you want to keep doing that when you don't. Um, I feel like racers that do this while they're racing are constantly doing this like math in their head of where their competitors are and where they're, where they are. And I have like absolutely seen what Kevin has done, seen other racers do this in a race where if they're not like near the podium when they want to be, even if it's not a realistic expectation, it's like pull the plug and start coasting and totally give up and start taking hand ups and, you know, like while it's over. <laughs> and so, um, while Kevin's, uh, headspace, I imagine during these races is very much fixated on other racers and where they are in relation to the podium. Um, I still don't think that staying sharp throughout the race or, you know, focusing like Kevin said is what is holding them back. I think it's coming from a place of having a goal that they're measuring for success in the race, um, that is different from an expectation. Um, but then as soon as, you know, that's without outside of reach or something like Kevin's just not focusing on, um, on those process goals that Hannah was talking about, you know, um, very much about the other riders. And when you start out racing and that's how you learn to race, it's kind of hard to get out of that headspace. Yeah. Well said. I, I, that actually, what you just said, Ivy makes me think of, I received what I thought was really wise insight from Chloe Woodruff one time. Um, and she said, if you ever find yourself in a race thinking that you should be in a different position than you are, you're wrong. You should be wherever you are in that race. So you just need to focus on the battle at hand. And I think about that a lot because I think we all have a tendency to have that exact thought when we race, I shouldn't be here or I should be higher up. And mm -hmm. those shoulds are just not helpful. You need to stay positive and present with exactly where you are. That's really good advice. And then regardless of the outcome or whoever is there that is faster than you, you are still looking inwardly and thinking about where you should be in the race, regardless of that other stuff and what else is happening. Mm -hmm. It's cool when you get to that space. Nate. Your thoughts. These, these are fantastic points that are all resonating with me personally, by the way. So <laughs> yeah. even though you say you're the only one, Nate, um, I, I, I've struggled with this too. This is uh, pretty close to what both of you were already saying, but it says process goals versus outcome goals. If you focus on an outcome goal in a race, you don't know who's going to show up. It's so hard. Even going from 20 to 15, you all been in a race, right? Where sometimes it's easy. And then sometimes so many fast people show up, you actually raced better but your placement is lower. That is so tough mentally. And for me, for mountain biking, I would focus on like, I don't, like, I guess I did podium on some lower level categories, but mm -hmm. I would focus on, I'm going to hit this turn smoother this time on the laps. I'm going to do, uh, I'm not going to be as uh, punchy on this climb. I'm going to 
you know, maintain power better. Uh, I'm going to take this turn better. All, all those things are the process things that in the race that I try to focus on. And I, if I improve in the race and I keep riding better and I get 15th or 20th, that's like such a win though, right? Because you got better and you improved and that's what you need to do those process goals in order to become a faster racer and do better in the future. Yeah. I, uh, any time I've experienced this across racing, motocross, skiing, uh, cycling, everything. And in every situation when I've experienced it, it's because I have, um, all the, I'm doing all the things wrong. Like you're saying I'm placing in, in, it used to be like it was a it was against the competition and where I'm sitting against the competition isn't where I had envisioned. But then it also started to become I had too high of expectations for myself. Like regardless of the competition entirely, I just had too high of expectations for myself and what I could deliver on that day wasn't exactly what I had in mind and what I thought I could do. And in those situations man, what you just said is so fantastic. What Chloe said to you is so fantastic. And it resonates with me. The best races I've had, Nate, I don't know if this resonates with you, but like the best races I've had are when I'm not really thinking about something before or after, but I'm right there in the moment. And it's like, I'm engaging in some sort of battle or I'm making all the small little chess moves. And that feels so good. Um, I imagine it's kind of like what, like a jazz musician feels like or something when they're like, if they're playing or, or just any musician when they're playing live with somebody and they're working with each other in those moments. And it's like, you're just kind of lost in the process of doing that. And it feels so good. And when you can race and do that, and whether it's looking at turns and hitting those or doing anything else, that's great. Uh, if I can just reiterate one bit of advice that Hannah said that I thought was really good for mountain bikers in particular and cyclocross, this could be helpful is, and because this will stop people from, and we're going to get into this, this is a bit of foreshadowing for a question later, but starting too hard, what a great rule to kind of put for yourself to say, I'm not going to let my lap times drop or deviate more than 10% from each other. Like from the first lap or from the fastest lap, whatever lap that is to the slowest lap, there isn't going to be bigger than a 10% gap. And what that could do, I, cause I find in a lot of situations, athletes have great fitness or they have great something but then it's just the execution sabotages the fitness that they had or sabotages the great uh, like position they put themselves in in the race. And it's just a bad decision. And usually it's tied to pacing, particularly in mountain biking. If you start slow, especially in like middle to lower categories and even cat one categories, if you, if you weren't going to be battling with the front, you might as well start slow because it's going to likely end up in a faster race by the end. Um, and give you a chance to like get that exhilarating feeling of passing people and coming through the field at the end, instead of just blowing up and kind of trickling backward. But yeah, it always comes from too much stress and anxiety that I'm putting on myself to perform at some level, whether that's based on other people or just myself. That's, that's my experience with it. So great advice. Crushed it. Uh, Maria's question. And this is the one that we're going to talk about and starting too hard. <clears throat> Maria says, what's the best way to figure out the mismatch in my training and my performance at an event. So I recently completed a 50 K mountain bike marathon race. And to prepare for this event, I created a custom training plan. Looking back on my training, I believe I completed it close to what was prescribed and looking at Maria's training, she did perform quite well in terms of, uh, checking off the workouts that were there, uh, that were scheduled. Uh, so fantastic job, uh, Maria, a bit about my event performance. Overall, I felt solid during the event. Uh, 64% of the four plus hour event was in the threshold zone. Big red flag to me instantly uh, hearing that, right? Uh, <laughs> so we're talking about uh, a race that in this case is like uh, two and a half to three hours, I believe. We'll we'll see the the stuff a little bit later, but two and a half to three hours, 64% in threshold. Yikes, that's going to be really tough. The remainder was in tempo. I felt strong on the technical single track and felt like I could keep going, even though my heart rate was high. And then in parentheses, I wonder if this has to do with short recoveries that you frequently get on flowy single track. Um, overall, how I felt after the initial climb and the HR data suggested to me that I worked hard, and which I'm happy with, but the disappointing part was my performance on the 1.5 mile climb from the start. So this really hard climb right in the beginning. Within the first minute, my heart rate was within the threshold zone and I watched everyone push ahead. My legs were burning and when we hit the super steep pitches, I just gave up and walked. So my question is, where did I go wrong in creating my training plan? What should I have done differently? Is there a trainer road feature that I did not utilize that could help me better perform and or perform better in future events? I'm questioning my ability to train to continue with trainer road because of this. 
So I'm hoping you can restore my faith and continue enjoying Trainer Road, which I love. So it's a great question. And this, Maria, in a lot of situations, this model is exactly what I was talking about in the sense that we have a disappointing outcome. So the first thing we do is like, must have been the training. And we step back and look at the training, which is a healthy thing to do. You should step back and look at what's going on. But there's also the execution side of things. And just, I'm going to run through some basic notes. I, uh, You linked to your career and everything, Maria. So I went through there and I checked some things out. And I just want to share some notes that'll give us some ground for then conversation for all of us. Uh, so looking at Maria's historical training volume and everything else over time, uh, over in the period of this race, looking at your six-week average TSS, it was double your highest TSS you've ever done before. So you were doing a ton of training coming into this, much more so than you've done in the past. So um, in that respect, you can expect that, and since you know you were building up through and you were training for this, but just the same, that's a lot. So you kind of have to err on the side of caution whenever you're thinking about adding in extra training if you're already really high. So with that in mind, I looked back and you've done really big events before, like Transylvania gravel, um, epic gravel race before, um, but you had a substantial taper coming into that. So you like didn't do a whole lot of riding and you didn't do training coming into that. You had a big, basically time to relax before then. And then also uh, the terrain, not as technical as the mountain bike race. But here's the big kickers looking at this. So the week prior to your event was the biggest volume that you've had in a long time. It was 80% bigger than the prior week. And then in addition to that, it was 75% more TSS than what you had scheduled. And if you look at this, it's almost in, in every, you do this in your training sometimes, this is really common. And I, I kind of want to call it like the low volume trap, which we're going to hit on later on uh, as well. But when you add on those really hard, really big weekend rides and you do it the week before, you probably dosed yourself with quite a lot of fatigue coming into this. You're already sitting at, at the record high TSS levels. And then the week before the race, you added in extra and you made it one of your biggest weeks. Then you go into your race week and uh, you can expect in those situations that your performance won't be ideal, right? Because you've added on so much TSS. So with that context in mind, um, let's talk about what in the, the, this context of the start climb was really hard, one and a half miles, looked down at heart rate, it was sky high, ended up watching the field walk away and then having to walk it. And that was like a big core disappointment of this race. Um, what occurs to you? And actually maybe, um, yeah, let's go to Hannah again first, but what occurs to you, Hannah, in terms of what may have gone wrong on the execution side, considering everything we've already talked about? Yeah. Mountain bike races start hard. Um, and if you're not used to that, it can be super overwhelming. Um, so I immediately go to a couple of thoughts. One, you need to practice those. And I know trainer road has some great hard start workouts. So maybe you included those. Um, and they were in her plan, by the way, she okay, was doing great. hard start workouts because the plan was she, you, we, she was plan builder and within plan builder, it was cross country marathon. And that has a lot of hard start sort of efforts. So awesome. That part good. was good. So great. So that means we can check that out. That wasn't the issue. You practice practice those. Um, the next thought I go to is what was your warm up like? Cause especially for some of these longer races, we think, you know, it's a long day in the saddle. I probably don't need to warm up as much because I don't want to burn as many matches. And that's a valid thought, but if it's going to start on a mile and a half climb like this, that's going to go out really hard. You do need to warm up. Um, mm -hmm. so if you didn't, your body might've been just kind of in shock as it entered <laughs> into that hard state. So, um, yeah, definitely warm up. If you didn't, that could be something to look at. And then thirdly, what were your mental preparations like? Because when we go this hard off the start line, I think our brain sort of sets off this alarm in our head of, oh my gosh, this is a long race. You're already hurting. Stop, 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 stop. So if you're not ready for that, those alarm signals are really scary and overwhelming, and they can lead to that, what you said, I gave up and I walked. Um, so that tells me maybe you just weren't quite mentally prepared to suffer that hard from the gun. And so I think it would be really valuable, and that's okay, it's a learning lesson, and I think it would be really valuable for you now, you know this, the next race, mentally prepare for that. No, hey, it's going to be really hard off the start here. And that's okay because it's going to slow down and I'm willing to push my body into that pain cave. And then I know that it'll get easier. Um, and so I think 
that mental preparation is really critical. And then if you still find that even with that mental preparation, you're just not quite up to snuff with that start, at least you've mentally prepared. And now you can switch that mindset and say, hey, everyone's going really, really hard right now. And I know they're going to ease up. So even though I'm getting dropped, I'm not going to give up. And then you, you even said the rest of your race was great. So mm -hmm. maybe you're just going to pass all those people anyways. Um, but if you let yourself get into that disappointed mindset already in the first mile and a half of the race, that definitely takes away energy and takes away maybe some potential ability later on. Mm -hmm. Maria, so I have a slightly different than Hannah, but slightly the same. Maria, you're not racing for the win. Mile and a half climb. You should not be in threshold one minute in. You went way, way too hard. You mm -hmm. should... So many times I've done this where you start on a long climb, like everybody passes me. And then over the race, you start passing person after person after person. You see them all again because there's no, like you do a hard start workout, do a hard start workout where one minute you go really hard and now try to hold even sweet spot. Your, your heart rate's still going to be in threshold. If you would have just done sweet spot the whole time, uh, you'd be much more relaxed. And this race took her four hours and 20 minutes. There's no reason on a mile and a half climb, I'm guessing this is a fire road climb, uh, to go that hard to try to stay with anyone on this race. And I, I looked at it, there's like three long climbs. I don't know if it's single track or not, but even if, I mean, if you're a Hannah, Ivy, Jonathan, they do go hard to stay with that group and get that benefit. But if you're, I think you'll go f much, much faster overall, if you just pace yourself and, mm. uh, especially cause you don't have a power meter. If in one minute you're at threshold power, your power was way higher than threshold. It was VO2 max or above. Uh, and that's how you got to that heart rate so quickly. So don't do that. Yeah. Well said. <laughs> well said. I, yeah. I just want to say, I think that's excellent advice. Um, totally echo that. I also didn't realize that this individual didn't have a power meter. So another thing to think about in that is if you're using heart rate to measure your effort at the beginning of the race, it might be a little skewed anyways, because you're nervous. Maybe you've had caffeine, um, all kinds of things that lead into the start of a race. And so, I actually personally would, if I don't have power, I wouldn't use heart rate. I'd use that. I'd use rate of perceived exertion, especially at the start of a race, just because you might be standing on the start line with a heart rate of 120 already, just from nerves. <laughs> we're we're going to talk about this at the end of the podcast today, but I think uh, almost the majority of last week, I was in the threshold heart rate zone uh, before uh, Ironman Oceanside. Like usually when people hear the waves or like see the waves, it's like nice and relaxing. And I was just like, whoop, like my, my heart rate just like stayed. So I was terrified. So yeah, good point. Look, look, looking at this, um, at the actually map, her climbs were their streets, their roads. So they're not single track. So even more reason while not mm -hmm. to go hard and to, uh, Hannah, at the very beginning of the race, RPE lies. It's a liar. Mm -hmm. Like True. Do you True. think how many time trials you, I've done so many time trials where I'm like, well, I can hold 400 Watts for this whole race. I, <laughs> yeah. I can't believe it. <laughs> and then about oh a minute in, I'm like, Oh, I, uh, <laughs> never mind. <laughs> I literally, and this, this happens to everyone, even pros. I literally did a time trial the other day, um, just in training where I started and I was like, huh, 400 Watts for one minute. Mm, power meter must be off today. And then a minute in, I was like, Nope, body's off. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Ivy. Uh, I think we underestimate as athletes, a train of power, how well we really know riding by RPE and how frequently we forget to utilize it in a circumstance like this. Like when we train with power, um, well, I hope not, I hope you're not just staring at your, uh, head unit, you know, <laughs> but I think we're better acquainted with what those, uh, efforts really feel like as we're doing them and forget to utilize it in a circumstance like this, when, we don't have power and, and, you know, that translate from right from writing indoors, um, to going outside and not having a power meter. Like you still know what that effort feels like. Um, and just when I echo Hannah, that there was maybe a mental preparation aspect that was neglected here. And it's so easy to misdiagnose where things go wrong. I totally empathize with that, like have a bad race and be like, 
I need blood work. I don't know. Something's wrong with me. <laughs> like, you know? yeah. I need to move cities. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Something's wrong. Yeah. 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 Move to altitude. And it's like, yeah. nope, actually I, um, just rest, just rest. I forgot more. to eat yesterday. Yeah. That's probably yeah. what did it. And so, uh, you know, I just urge Maria to keep being curious. Like it's great Maria that you listen to the podcast and, um, you know, are asking these kinds of questions and trying to learn from people about what you should change and what could go wrong. Because I think the more we do that as athletes, the more, uh, easy it will be to correctly identify those issues. Um, and yeah, that's something I've struggled with for sure, but keep being curious and, you know, DM John all your questions and, um, <laughs> <laughs> wide open <laughs> hey, Jonathan <laughs> underscore. See you there. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, I last... think, oh, go, ahead. go ahead. No, yeah, you, sorry. Hannah. no, you go. Oh, I was just going to say, I just wanted to take a moment to be a cheerleader for Maria, because if mm. the race was four hours plus, and the only disappointing part was the mile and a half at the start, man, you crushed it. Um, yeah. So great work. It sounds like your training was awesome leading into it and prepared you really well. Mm -hmm. This was like so cool about cycling. Uh, Marie's an accomplished cyclist, you know, doing all these tough events and they're, you know, thinking about what Hannah had said about short track and strategy for Kevin too. Like this is, What's so cool about cycling? You can be racing for 20 years or more and learn a whole new uh, approach to executing, even just training that makes it more enjoyable for you. Um, mm. Cycling is cool. Okay, sorry. Thanks for coming to my TED Talk. <laughs> <laughs> so more things about RP pacing at the beginning. Uh, again, I would, for the first maybe two or three minutes, go slower than you think you can. Everyone's going to pass you. And then use your ventilatory threshold where on a race like this, I would never be in the third one. So the, you know, the first is what we just have right here. The second is kind of like <sighs> squeezing in words between breaths. Maybe. Yeah. You can kind of do it. And the third is <sighs> you can't talk. If you're, if you're one minute in and you're in the third ventilatory threshold and you have a mile and a half climb, it, you, you're going way too hard. And th th I think that's a great way to pace yourself because heart rates can lie on race day, right? Like we, like Hannah said, uh, we could go both both ways, probably higher than it. I should go both ways with tapers and stuff like that. So I would definitely listen to your breath, RP and feeling and go so much like that. That first climb should not be that hard, right? If you're in a four and a half hour race, you should get at the top and be like, cool. I can still, I feel like I want to race. Mm -hmm. uh, not that you want to push your bike. Yeah. And two, mm -hmm. Maria, I want to say for every one of us, mile and a half climb, we could go so hard that we all would push our bike where we mm -hmm. could like just destroy ourselves and then not be able to make the whole climb. This isn't something about lack of fitness. I think it's more of a pace. Mm -hmm. I got a message just this last week from an athlete and they said, Hey, like I had my FTP increase to 301 Watts from 250 Watts. I had great fitness coming into this race. And they're like, and I completely like, I dropped out of the crit that I did the first race of the season like, what is this? Like, what, what do I not have fitness? So I asked them to share the link to their race file. And for the first, I kid you not for the first five minutes of that race, which I'm thoroughly impressed with the power, they averaged 375 Watts for the first five <laughs> minutes. <laughs> and I was like, I was like, hey, I don't care what fitness you have. If you do 375 minute or 375 Watts for the first five minutes, you're going to be blown. And then if the field was, who was probably just chilling behind this athlete, comes right by you that doesn't mean that they're way more fit than you that just means that you executed incorrectly and this is so important uh for athletes to in this process of breaking down a bad result you need to look at the training objectively and in this case look back at what you did the week before it's so tempting the week before like in this case maria went out and did a pretty big ride on the saturday before this saturday race um it added in a lot of tss it was pretty tough it's really tempting to do that and pre-riding is a really big trap to fall into when you can, in this case, it wasn't pre-ride of the course, but I see this commonly with athletes. They go and pre-ride the course, but it's basically like doing the race, just doing it a week ahead of the time. And then they have to go and do it again the next week. So look at that week before. Was it really heavy? It That week before should be substantially less in terms of time and TSS than what you've been doing leading up into that. That's what tapers are. And that's what gets built into when you use like a custom plan with trainer road. Then after that, you need to look at how you came into the race and how you executed. And it's really important. Then you can look at nutrition and pacing and all that other stuff that 
that really is the art of using the fitness that you've built. Um, but that's kind of the flow chart to, to roll through that I would suggest. That race, the 370 for five minutes, yeah. that was 125% of threshold for five minutes. That is like an, if you're going to do a VO two max test, like what's my power PR, that's how long you would do it. Yeah. And then think about then finishing a crit after if anyone's ever done that outside, <laughs> those are the worst, like you want to fall off your bike. So I could see I've how done you would that not before finish. too, though. Haven't you, Nate? Like, I mean, I've done that before, like where I just completely blow up the start of a race and I rode too hard and it was foolish of me to do. So it's not like it's, we're, we're standing on some sort of like, you know, alabaster throne here pointing down at the rest. It's the it first time I did a, an A crit in Reno after this is like 13 years ago. Yeah. yeah I, I died in about, I think it lasted like three laps. Then I was like, nope, can't do this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We all do it. Uh, but anyway, but great insights from, from this whole thing. So, um, if you're listening right now and you have a situation like this, that you want to send in, maybe you want us to like check things out with your career and all that, uh, send it in trainerroadcom slash podcast. That's where all the questions come from. And if you want to get fast, like Maria would amazing, uh, fitness coming into this thing, then you go to trainerroadcom and sign up. It'll make you faster. Uh, Ivy, I kind of want you to kick this one off. I'm going to read the question, but, uh, I want you to share your insight on this. It's from Tyler. Uh, Tyler says, Hey, trainer road crew. I have a question regarding recovery rides. I've committed to doing every one of my low volume cyclocross workouts this year. Way to go. And three weeks in, and I can feel myself getting stronger. What like, uh, we talk about like, uh, I don't know, focus with your training or vision or like prioritizing most important things. What a really good way to look at this of being like, I'm committing to hitting my workouts. Like, instead of like, I'm committing to getting faster or I'm committing to something else because all of those things, there's a plenty that can get in the way. And then we engineer our own minds and our own minds, like how to get faster. I like this. I'm just like hitting all my workouts on a low volume plan. It's great. However, I have a recovery week coming up and I plan to do some of those rides outside. Last summer, I found I really enjoyed taking my recovery rides super easy, basically noodling around on the bike for an hour and then getting home and feeling really refreshed. Is there a downside to approaching my recovery week rides as almost a Z1 ride, or should I be looking for something closer to Z2, watching heart rate and power, et cetera? Uh, thanks for everything from Tyler. Cool. Well, from a physiological standpoint, can it hurt you to do uh zone? Well, I guess they're asking if it's bad to do zone one instead of zone two, probably not in your recovery day. But can it, from a mental standpoint, can it hurt uh, when you're considering the purpose of recovery week to uh, fixate on the difference between zone one and zone two? Sure, it could, um, especially if, you know, Tyler's feeling super refreshed at the end of these recovery rides. Uh, I don't think it's um, because of the difference of those few watts between zone one and one two. I think it's because he's really just loving himself, absolutely enjoy the relaxation of rest day and let it serve its purpose to rejuvenate him. And so while there are times and workouts, um, you know, many intentional intervals that we can think of where focusing on the last few percentage of your power target is really important. This isn't one of those times because the purpose of your recovery as a fundamental goal is to just, you know, keep it chill and use it that time to feel restored and refreshed for the workouts that are really, really important that you need to nail later that week. So, no, it's not going to hurt you to do zone one instead of zone two and keep getting the most out of those recovery rides and let it be chill. That's super great. Is this how you, uh, how do you approach like your recovery weeks? Um, and, and to be clear, a recovery week isn't a be week when you're like off the bike, you're still on the bike, that sort of thing. <laughs> uh, it's just, you know, different workouts. I had a recovery week last week and I, uh, spent one entire day. Um, I'm in the Bay area. I'm, I'm not, I won't go back to Montana until it's done snowing there. So I'm just <laughs> <laughs> avoiding home. So I'm in the Bay area training and stuff. And, um, uh, I spent one of my recovery days, uh, took a backpack and my bike over to like the San Francisco city proper and just rode around super chill. And some of the Hills are really steep and I paper boyed and took my time to make sure I'd stayed relaxed and, got pizza and saw all the tourist sites and it was great. Um, so that's how I approach my recovery weeks. Like there are times when I'm like, all right, I have to get out and, you know, I'll go on this specific route and maybe work on these technical skills. And other times I'm like, yeah, I'm just going to go ride my bike to get a piece of pizza. It'll be great. Um, mm -hmm. yeah. And then I feel super excited to actually do structure training the week that follows because of it. I feel super refreshed. Mm -hmm. 
a huge key. Hannah, how about you? Yeah, I think that this is something that has taken me a long time in my career to come to. And I think a lot of people can probably relate to that because as cyclists, a lot of us are type A athletes. And so we want to do everything 100% all the time, perfectly. <laughs> um, and recovery weeks, gosh, sometimes that's just exhausting, like truly. Um, and so there's been a lot of times in my life where I have a recovery ride, but I have to squeeze it in between this and that. And I have to wake up at 5 a.m. to get this done and that done. Or maybe it's raining and I'm going out on the ride and riding in the rain to get my recovery ride in. And that is just not the point. The point of recovery is to truly recover. And I always saw it as a sign of weakness to ease into that. But now I actually see it as a sign of confidence. Um, when I can say, hey, it's not worth it today. I'm going to go for a walk instead of a ride, or I'm going to stretch instead of doing this recovery day. And I think that when you really can tap into that and find the confidence to know what you need to do in order to recover, that's that's when you really, you're not just doing the workouts, you're achieving the overall goal. Um, and that's that's what we're trying to do here. It's the prep you for the next block to train hard. And it's not just physically, but it's also mentally what Ivy said, because I get into that recovery week and I just like, I don't want to do those easy rides. And I want to tell everyone, this is totally valid. You have an hour one, switch it to Taku minus one. That is the best. Uh, I do it like sometimes without a fan. Then you watch Ted Lasso. Your day will be amazing. <laughs> <laughs> that That is the, the, the I think people don't do that enough as you think you, you, you go, you know, really hard. And if you get it, you have to listen to your body. Sometimes that, that three week block is a lot and you might have to have the first day off. Then you do a taku, you take a day off and you do taku. Uh, recess, and maybe then recess 30, you know, like yeah, ex exactly. Work. And when you, again, it's so you can get that next workout and train. Um, and there's also something else that I made a very rookie mistake. Um, I take Vyvanse because they're all shortage. And this morning, I think I took a sleeping pill instead of Vyvanse. They're exactly the same. <laughs> so, you doing all right? I'm going to go upstairs and go get my Vyvanse. So I'll be right back because I am crashing hard here. I know. That's I've done this once before. Goodness. The pills are the same color. They're blue and white. They just have like oh, different well, writing on them. Oh, my God. Oh, oh, I my know. Goodness. Yeah. So, I'll be so right this back. is like Nate just took like a shot of tequila and now is like oh now let, let me have a shot of espresso right after it like, <laughs> <laughs> chemicals in nate's body are just like, exactly. they're gonna fight it out uppers and downers <laughs> oh yeah, back. the um i want to oh point gosh. something out we actually noticed this um so it, i it's interesting I, um there's this obsession i think and and i think a lot of coaches to kind of market themselves on this that like they have like the best training plans or the best workouts. And it's kind of like this secret interval combination that you need or something like that. And what we've noticed and looking at our data at trainer road is that the, the people that, that improve regularly and consistently, they're just consistent with their training. And it's kind of funny, like even like comparing like one plan to the next, in most cases, it's just comes down to how consistently they followed the plan, whether it made them faster or not. Sure. They, you see differences in terms of their fitness profile and stuff, but consistency is super important. And that's our focus. And for us, one of the things that we noticed was athletes are doing too much in their recovery weeks and it, whether, and so what we did is we intentionally dropped. If you look at all of our training plans now compared to a year ago, you'll notice that the recovery weeks are easier than they used to be. And it's because what we're trying to do is reinforce this, make it easy. And adding on top of that, use workout alternates, like Nate said, and like, if you have a workout, that's like your recovery workout on there, make it shorter, make it easier and, and do that. Because the point is, um, if you take the whole week off, sometimes your body can kind of get into this mode where it's like, thank you so much. And I never want to go through strain again. <laughs> and then when you come back to training, it can feel really tough. So there's a point that we, you know, you stay on the bike and it's not like you're doing something hard, but there's a point in staying on the bike in that regard. I'm not really sure the mechanism that goes there. It might just be bro science, but, uh, that is something that's, that's workout alternates is your friend during this, these recovery weeks and make yourself, your vision should be how to like, just like Nate said, how do I set myself up best for next week? 
Uh, this is probably one of the biggest differences I've actually seen in uh, Keegan's training uh, in the past two years is that, and I think it's because uh, everything else was turned up so much that the rest weeks really had to be turned down. <laughs> Uh, and it's, but he's a pro at rest weeks now, very much going very easy. This is not the time to add on. Like Ivy mentioned, like, uh, there's soul fulfilling rides, like soul rides that you go on, but this probably isn't the time to go out with your friends and do that five hour ride. Uh, that's really big. That's not the week for it. Um, you can do it again. And at some other point when it's not that week where you really need to set yourself up for success. And sometimes you'll notice that you'd you do a week like that and you do a recovery week hard and you feel fine the next week. But the hard thing is, is what happens two weeks later, six weeks later, 10 weeks later, when you've introduced this spot where you should have been recuperating, but you weren't, it has a long tail effect and it can kind of compound and affect you more later on. Um, so that would be my advice on that. Don't, don't, don't diet on the recovery week. I know y'all oh, want so, to, Yeah. don't diet. You're, you, this is where your body's repairing itself. Uh, again, you're setting yourself up for training. If you diet, you're going to get into a hole. It's so easy. I've been there too. You're like, it is. I, That's not easy. For, I feel like my hunger is turned up to 12 on recovery weeks. So like, listen to your body. That's that's listen yeah. to what it is. But how often though, do you say, ah, oh, I'm dieting. So I shouldn't have this, these extra, like this <laughs> baked potato or something. I should not it's do it. It's easy to fall into the trap, right? Nate, because it, it's mm -hmm. super tempting. It's like, I'm doing less work. So I should take in less calories, but that's not the reason. The, point. <laughs> the reason why your body's so hungry is because it needs fuel to repair. Like a day after the day after I lift weights, my body's so hungry because it wants to be anabolic. It wants to build muscle. And if I don't give it that fuel, it's not going to happen. Uh, and two John's John's done this. Uh, it's not the time. I mean, every, everyone has a life, but it's not the time to do like, oh, I'm going to re redo the backyard on my rec recovery week <laughs> and work eight hours a day and do all this stuff. Yeah. Maybe you want to take an extra recovery week after that. Cause you know, there's life stuff happening. And then the, the number one way I think during your recovery week to actually recover add an extra hour of sleep every night, mm -hmm. that is by far the best way to recover. And I think, uh, as you're eating sufficient calories, sleep is probably even more important if you were down like 200, uh, calories a day or something, there was, I've mentioned this before, there was a study where they did, um, the calorie matched people in a deficit in two groups. And one had like nine hours of sleep per night. And the other had like five, I think. And what happened is they both lost the same amount of weight, something like over the course, it was like seven pounds. The, the, the group that slept less, almost all of it was muscle and the group that slept enough, it was almost all fat. Mm. which is insane. You know what I mean? You do all this work and you want to change your body composition and you don't sleep. You're just losing that muscle that you built. And then you have to then do the process again. And you're not going to get faster that way. Sleep is yeah. so important and it's so hard to like, so hard to go to bed early. For Chances me are if you're training like, you know, four to five hours a week on a low <laughs> volume plan, right? Uh, you're probably going to be doing closer to two hours of training, two to three hours, maybe during that recovery week, take those hours that you would be on the bike and find ways to fit them into sleep. That's like, it's like a good basic rule is to hunt that basically whatever time I would be spending on the bike. And I've cut down. If you want to think very mechanistically about it, make sure that you allocate that much time throughout your week for recovery activities, whether it's sleeping or, you know, something else that it's recuperative. I, I had another thought. Take, oh. Oh, go ahead, Hannah. You go. I just want to take that to the next level. Same thing with what Nate said of not doing the yard work and adding the sleep. If you want to go like really next level with your recovery week, I would even take the time that you normally ride, literally the time, not just the hour, but I always get on my bike from 6 to 7 p.m. Keep that block free. Don't let people mm -hmm. come into it because it's only one week. So if you start filling that time with appointments and you're available, it becomes really hard then to protect that time again the next week, because now your family, your job, your friends, they all know that time is available. If you just keep that time protected, it's a lot easier to keep it protected in future weeks when you're training. And then it really is an hour where it's like, I'm not, I'm not riding or what, whatever it might be that is just yours to play with. Maybe you take a nap, maybe you meal prep. 
I don't know, maybe read, whatever it is that you like, I think that's a really nice time to protect. That is a pro tip right there. That is so cool. And for those who uh, have partners, that's something to communicate really far away, right? Because you don't want to do it on that day and be like, nah, I, don't, I just want to do this. And to that protected time could also be handled with the partner say, let's go see a movie, right? Mm -hmm. Like it could be a, a chill time, but it's not the the other stuff. Um, I have an idea. I just said I couldn't go to sleep. Maybe I've been switching the Vivans and the sleeping pills <laughs> every night. It's like, I need to like, oh, no. I don't know, I'll do something else. <laughs> the truth comes uh, out. <laughs> no, I, I feel like they're way too close in your cabinet. If this is yeah, happening. they're they're all they're like, they look like this. And I just pull one and I'm like, oh, that's a blue pill. Like, uh, oh, I need man. to get those special bottles. Um, ooh, that's another pro tip. For those who do take medication, you can buy bottles online that tell you um, the last time you opened the bottle which yeah. is when you have ADHD so many times in the morning, I go, did I take my, my antidepressant <laughs> or my, I don't know. And I go look at it and I go, oh yeah, I did. Very, very important. Um, I kind of have a food thing. I want to go off for, for on a second. Is that okay? Yeah, for sure. Of course. Have you guys heard of the creamy, the Ninja creamy? I have it. Is this an ice cream thing? Creamy? Yeah. It's like, I saw it on TikTok. So I haven't even used it yet, but I'm sold <laughs> based on TikToks. You basically, you make your, you, make your base, mm -hmm. you freeze it, and then you put it in it, and it makes looks like it makes amazing ice cream. Like but saucer the reason, of ice cream? No, like haagen ice cream, okay. so, frozen yogurt, uh, like smoothies. It does different settings. But the thing that is so cool about this is, so I love some ice cream at night, but I'm also lactose intolerant. And I honestly don't want the profile of the sugar and stuff. And it, sometimes it can be actually too sweet. But what you can do in here is you can make like, you know, protein powder, you can adjust the sweetness, you can mm -hmm. put in berries and they, they mix it into that. And I'm hyping it up, but it was relatively cheap, like 150 or something. But if I can get healthy ice cream every night that has like 30 grams of protein, minimum sugar, that sounds like heaven. Oh, uh, yeah. I'm not that sponsored by them. You can sponsor I Ivy. I was ready for me. <laughs> Sponsor my ninja. Too. <laughs> yeah. And what I, if, what if in the summer, instead of like your protein drink after the ride, you could just make that same drink into ooh. ice cream form. So yeah. Oh, people, um, people will take like, uh, a can of pineapple, put it in the little thing, freeze it for 24 hours and do it. And you get like a Dole Whip from Disneyland. Yeah. And you just get, so instead of, so if you want some fast carbs after your ride, you get some protein shake, then you just eat like an ice cream cone of Dole Whip. Doesn't that sound amazing rather than like the crap we usually drink of like, this is a sports yeah. sugar drink. Yeah. <laughs> There's science to this too, because the, 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 the prolonged time at high core temp after training delays recovery. Um, mm -hmm. I've seen studies on this very thing. Mm. And when you can, the quickest way to drop your core temp is to ingest something that is frozen. Uh, so like a slushy an icy, anything else like that, I could be, a, I, I mean, so basically what you're saying Nate, is this is science back and we all need to get ice cream uh, machines. But, but <laughs> Hannah's I'm going to do this. Hannah, Hannah's the, the right idea. A, like a protein, uh -huh. man, a, 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 like a recovery ice cream. This is a, this is a whole market. Cause you could probably get the, <laughs> the, 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 you want sugar, right? And you can put oh, the yeah. protein in there and then you can make it like, we're going to have strawberry ice cream tonight. It's my daughter's birthday. And then we're going to vanilla and mix in M&Ms. It will mix in M&Ms to you like a blizzard. Oh man. I, I haven't even tried it, but just <laughs> it might be all like content marketing of people all over TikTok, but it sounds freaking amazing. I can't believe you guys haven't been on. Oh, go ahead. Just oh, I just want Nate to post on. They will say Ooh, their opinion. Food critics, they are right. They're, they're huge. Well, but Gordon one of the Ramsey's, the, yeah. The <laughs> strawberry one was made with strawberry extract rather than just plain strawberry. So I'm going to call that one. Uh huh. Question uh, mark. Um, um, yeah, question mark. Like, don't don't knock it yet. I'll do some more. But if I can develop a tasty recovery ice cream after a heart ride, oh man, it gets so hot. You sit down with some ice cream and eat that. It'd be amazing. I already sounds... do this every summer when you're like doing your protein <laughs> shake and I just, I, I always put it in the blender. Like don't do, I don't like the blender bottles. Like I want to put some like frozen fruit in there. So that's like a little bit colder. And mm -hmm. in the summer when it's really hot and I'm opening the fridge, I'm like, mm, I could do yogurt or I could just like put a couple scoops of ice cream in there and just like make a milkshake mm. with protein in it. It's awesome. <laughs> I, I have not had ice cream in years because it, uh, because of lactose intolerance. And it, it's like one of the biggest, like 
things I feel like I miss out on. I want Don, it so bad. They make all the fake time. ice cream now. Like yeah. tons of kinds. I checked that ice. out. I checked it out. And it's like the protein style ice cream. It has so much fat, like so many calories mm. in it. I know it doesn't have sugar, but it has like so many. So if I can Even make my there, own, then yeah. I can control that and change that. There is some lactose free ice cream, but I just make your own. The Fair Life milk we can get in the US. <laughs> it actually has yeah. extra protein. It's delicious. My kids drink it. Uh, it has like twice the amount of protein as regular milk. I wonder if I could cool. use oat milk or almond milk or something like that in this freezy sure. thing. Was it called a freezy but, thing? No, uh, creamy. Creamy. Oh yeah. I'm, Do the, um, try the fair life milk. I'm telling you, I'm lactose intolerant. I drink yeah. so much of it now and I have zero issues. Nice. Cool. I'm in. This is probably helping a lot of people. I know you all think it's a tangent, but I bet a lot of people are going to enjoy this. So. This was on the agenda, just like to say it was. <laughs> we just made his heels. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'll just type good. it in right now. <laughs> uh, this one's going to be kind of a big one again uh, from Michael. We're going to get into an athlete's like training and, and look at that. Uh, so if you want to, I've linked already to an athlete's calendar and the plan and everything. And it's a question. It's from Michael. Uh, Michael says, Hey, trainer road team. I love the platform of podcast. I'm relatively new to structured training. I started using trainer road about a year and a half ago. And prior to that, I have no other structured training experience. My question for you guys has been, has to do with training load. I was doing the mid volume crit plan over the winter during the base phase when I wasn't racing or riding outside much. And that felt good. Now that the race season has started, I do mostly crit racing. I have switched to the low volume crit plan because on top of those three workouts per week, I like to get out for three to four hours of pretty consistent Z2 on Saturday and Sunday. And then I also race most Tuesdays and practice crit series near where I live. So I've instantly got a red flag uh, because like I see, I see Alex Wild and Keegan doing consistent Z2 and that's basically it. Uh, whenever people say I do consistent Z2 for three to four hours, then you look at their rides. It's far from consistent. Um, and you end up, if you look at time and zone, or if you look at the power profile, it does not look like a workout. If you're going to do like Z2 stuff, that's intentionally not going to be too hard. It should look like that. So there's one red flag. I'm looking, I'm looking at one of his rides. Yeah. <laughs> it is not that's Z2. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's the quote consistent Z2. And, and look like Michael, you are absolutely in good company. I I'm being serious in the sense that I, I've seen Ivy's rides look like this, uh, not like what we're looking at here on Michael's rides, but they're consistent. Um, I've oh, seen, I thought you meant, uh, I thought you meant, um, uh, no, stochastic. <laughs> I, I do that. I do that sometimes. I do that. <laughs> I haven't I seen don't... Hannah's, but I trust that Hannah's are pretty good. Um, mm -hmm. like this, like that, that, that they're checking the box there in terms of being consistent, but these, this Z2 thing is really popular and, and it's kind of treated like choose your own adventure. And in most cases, it's actually quite hard to do. And in most cases, and if you're doing Z2 training, right too, it's, it's not recuperative. Like it's, it's hard. If you're doing three to four hours, it's hard. Like that, that's a hard day on the bike and you're adding on a lot of strain. Um, but in almost every case, it's not being ridden consistently. And instead, uh, it looks like you're looking at an EKG over like seven days. It's just like, you know, <laughs> bouncing up and down all over the place and it's hard to track. So big red flag, just the same. Uh, so I'm going to recap this going from a mid volume plan to a low volume plan. Cause now they're introducing these races, but then also liking to do these three to four hour rides that are operating under the premise of just like consistent, just C2 quote, but instead it's actually something that's quite a big stressor. Okay. I'm starting to feel the intensity catching up with me. Is it the intensity or is it just the fact that it's the training load, Michael? Good thing to question. Um, I'm starting to feel the intensity catch up with me and I lost my spot. Um, and I feel like I need to skip something in my weekly routine. My legs feel sore after over and under workouts. And it feels like I'll, I will take two days before I start to feel good again. I remember you guys mentioning on the podcast several times recently, that threshold workouts are some of the most important workouts of the week. That's contextually dependent. If you're doing like a cyclocross plan or short track, the threshold workouts aren't that key, right? Ivy. <laughs> So mm -hmm. de mm. depends on what you're doing. Um, but however, these can be my most dreaded things on my weekly calendar. I can always finish them, but they are rough. So this week I skipped my anaerobic workout, Spanish needle minus three, so that I could survive the over-unders. What would you recommend in my situation? Should I do everything possible to make sure I do the threshold workouts or should I mix it up each week? Uh, it sounds like already, uh, in this case, Michael's like, which one should I skip? And should I just rotate through the skipping? Uh, it's a different training. It's complicated. My first A race isn't until early June, and I will be starting the specialty phase in a couple of weeks. Hopefully I gave you enough info to go off on and didn't ramble on too much. No, Michael is fantastic. He gave us lots of great information on this. So um, 
if I can point out three uh, main uh, things that I'm seeing here, then that'll form the basis for the discussion. Um, number one, this is the low volume trap, right? Where it's like, I'm going to go down to low volume training. So because I'm going down to low volume training, I can add four more hours of riding every week. That's not going to be very tightly controlled. And I'm going to race. So if you step back and look like you might've dropped down from seven hours to three to four hours in terms of your structured work, but you're over doubling that once you add in all the other stuff that you're doing. Nate, go ahead. I, so this is what I've talked about before. Uh, you know, it's the intensity. I looked at two of your last rides and one was a two hour and 30 minute ride. And you did 51 minutes above Z2, a lot of it threshold, VO2 max and anaerobic. Your next one, your three hour and 43 minute ride, you did 80 minutes above it, cool. a lot of it threshold. So almost 90 minutes of like higher end stuff inside of there. Those are hard rides, right? That's a, Yikes. The, yeah, that's a We're hard We're coming ride. through with receipts hard right now. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> no, well, everybody should take because, this approach for each person, yeah. right? We should all do this. How many times have we thought what we do something? We just talked about TTs. We think we're one thing. And then you look <laughs> at the data, you're something else. And it helps. This is what a coach would do too, right? They'd be like, mm, you're actually not doing what we're supposed to be doing here. So if you want to do Z2, like, like do the Z2. And I can see you're, you're riding with some hills and stuff. And I think you're, uh, I can see the power spiking up on all the hills that you're, you're climbing. Um, maybe it's a gear issue that you can't gear down enough, or maybe you just like the climbs and it feels good to go hard on climbs. If you're going to be doing that, I would either pick a different course so that you can stay in Z2. Um, you can set alarms too. And like a Garmin, I'm not sure about a Wahoo that will beep at you. It's so annoying. <laughs> that's good because <laughs> yeah. you'll be like, I'm doing it all the time, but that just brings that awareness forward that you're not actually, uh, in that zone. Oh, that's a, that's a really good tip, Nate, on using the, the alerts feature on your Garmin. You can also, what you do can do is if you, you can find zone two workouts on trainer road, right? There's tons of endurance workouts, find those and send it to your head unit. So you're doing it outside. And then if you're using a Garmin or a Wahoo and you fall outside of your power target, it will go beep boop and it'll like, <laughs> it'll annoy you. Uh, and that way you can use that too. It, it can be an easy way to do it. Hannah, sorry. Also your goal in these Z2 rides is to hold Z2 the whole time. And we understand that if you do go outside and there's stoplights and things like that, like that's fine, be safe. But my point in this is I get asked a lot about if you're looking at average power or normalized power for these rides. And that is such a slippery slope because what people yes. will do, and I almost wonder if this person is doing this is since they're hilly rides, when they go downhill, they see their power drop. So then when they mm -hmm. go uphill, they want to drag that average up. And then what you're doing is intervals. You're not doing a Z2 ride. So I would stop looking at average power for your ride and just focus on holding that power second to second throughout your ride. And Hannah, you nailed it head on because this athlete, if you look they're almost all their rides are like 0.74 to 0.76 IF these Z2 rides. So number one, you're tipping into tempo, right? Uh, so you're not really accomplishing the goal unless your goal with that Z2 ride is to hold high Z2 low tempo. And in that case, you should be picking a route that doesn't force you to stop at all. Like you should have a route that just allows you to stay on the gas the whole day. But it's, if you look at it, it averages out to look like you're within the zone. But if you look at what you're actually doing, it's so far from it. And that brings a huge amount of fatigue. I think too, what might be happening is I'm looking at a ride. So FTP of 340, super strong, uh, normalized power 251. That gets that, uh, 70, 74, mm -hmm. um, IF, but then if you look at the average power, it's 204. So 204 divided by 340 is 0.6. So you could be like, Hey, I, I did it. I'm in zone two. <laughs> the average power is up. There's downhills and stuff like that. Like it is just second per second, be in that in, endurance zone. And for the times that you do, like Hannah said, you have a downhill or a, um, uh, a stoplight or something. I would just ignore those and just go second by second and stay in endurance. Um, plug, plug for trainer road. I know three hours and 43 minutes is really hard on the trainer, but the ability to do like two hours straight with absolutely no breaks does, I don't know. I've had great success doing that, uh, more so than going outside for like three or four hours. 
Uh, and then I get to watch like Ted Lasso the whole time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Ivy, what are your thoughts on this? Uh, we'll get into other other points here, but this is something that you and I personally have talked about that we see a lot of athletes struggle with. Right. And I, you know, I wonder if this is one of those scenarios where uh, there's a really important group ride or something that, or, you know, homies that Michael wants to ride with on the weekends, um, or that there's a specific purpose that this ride on the weekend serves like an off-road ride where you can work on technical skills and, you know, camaraderie of doing a group ride with your homies. And it's so hard to know that you need to, and want to do that. And knowing that it'll go above zone two and it sucks. I totally have to be that guy now. That's like, sorry guys, I'll be right there. I'm going to stay in zone two boo. And it's so <laughs> annoying. I feel so bad. about it. Um, and you know, if there, if there are opportunities in this, group ride to go hard or work on something that you need to work on and you want to do it, you should don't, you know, isolate and exclude yourself because you need to nail your workouts the next week. It just might mean that you need to adjust accordingly. And if there's one weekend, you know, that you do need to go hard with your friends or do one of those like adventure rides with your friends and you go outside of what you need to do, spend the next week and do, do an alternate, you know, choose a workout alternate for something that's shorter, a little bit shorter duration for that key workouts so that you feel like you can stay on top of recovery a little bit more and have a little more gas in the tank for the next weekend. Go ahead. Nate. Uh, two things. One, Ivy's doing more like videos, like one of my videos, please use the word homies in those videos. <laughs> that is, <laughs> I love that. Like <laughs> ever with your home, you get dropped by your homies. Here's what you do. Um, and two with, uh, sometimes I've done this, you ride with different homies on different days. And the best one in Reno, we have a group of older, um, mostly men, 65 and older, they go pretty chill, right? And it's they the love coolest to name ever, by the way. It's the procrastinating, procrastinating peddlers. peddlers. <laughs> All, they're so nice. It's super interesting to talk to them. And you can ride with those people and they're not gonna, at 340, I highly doubt these people are gonna like be dropping yeah. you on the climbs. And you just ride with that. It's social, it's still fun. Um, this has happened too, where like, uh, imagine John, when I was first doing it, you'd ride with me, that's your zone too. I was like, <laughs> going so hard at the climbs i could actually get a regular workout and john would just talk to me the whole time and ask me questions and i'd be like yeah. shut up <laughs> <laughs> but yeah I, this is not the day though for me on a zone two day to go out with like oh, i'm gonna ride with john and keegan today mm -hmm. that that's not because you do get that um i get a little bit codependent and i'm like i don't want to i don't want to ruin these people's rides so therefore i need to then abandon myself for what i'm doing and change my goals just so that I don't make them mad at me. Yes. Right. Or like never want to ride again. And that's, yes. just don't set yourself in that one. You shouldn't be doing that, but it's easier just to not put yourself in that position. Uh, yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. And, and recapping this, this continues into your recovery weeks as well, Michael, in this case, I see this on your training plan where you're doing your recovery weeks, you're doing the easy workouts, or sometimes you're just skipping those workouts and you're just doing a lot of riding and once again, when it's left to choose your own adventure, we often choose adventure rather than chill. And it makes it so that things get really kind of wild looking at your, I just want to put this in context. I mentioned the fact that like you dropped from the mid volume to the low volume plan. When you did that, your training stress has gone up since then 25%. So like, <laughs> so yeah. you, and, and you're training hours plus, plus. even more. So it's like, it's this fallacy because in your mind, you kind of build up, oh, I, since I'm doing low volume. It's going to be easier. Why am I getting tired? It must be the intensity. No, it's all the other stuff that you're adding in. And if you just look at it from just a very basic perspective, it's 25% more. If you look at it from second by second, when you're in your workouts, it's not following any sort of structure. And I've said this ad nauseum, but I hope it really sticks. If you aren't specific with your input, you should never expect a specific output with your training. So like if you're not specific, specific in terms of what you're doing, don't sp expect any sort of in, like uh, exact outcome from it. Um, and so they're kind I of like two things that I see there. Nate, go ahead. Yeah. I want to say a few things. One, you could, so if you love those rides and you're still going to make them hard, you do have to drop something, right? And you might want to drop maybe the, the Saturday before that ride, instead of making that a hard one, you go easy. The Thursday is probably another good ride to drop. The Tuesday is probably the most important out of those. Tuesday and then Saturday, then Thursday. That's kind of the order of low volume. I think to, uh, mm -hmm. Thursday is usually a bit, bit achievable. Um, but racing every week, though? 
that's a big red flag to me too. Right. Ivy, like mm -hmm. if you're racing every week and you're doing this, um, I mean, Ivy, do you pick and choose? Cause you're, you're kind of like, Ivy, you can race anything. Like, it's not like, uh, you're a mountain biker and you don't have a mountain bike series. So it's like, shucks, I guess I can't race. Ivy can race crits. She can race road races, cyclocross, mountain biking, <laughs> like track, like you, you can do it all. So how do you say no? And, or do you say no to races and how do you like walk yourself through that? Cause it's tempting to just race all the time. Yeah. It's horrible. And you get a lot of pressure and there, you know, you want to go see your homies and go to the race. <laughs> and, uh, there was a time where I thought I didn't have to train, uh, do intervals ever when I lived in, uh, Seattle, because there was a pretty on Tuesday, um, a like race, race car track, like you know, Pacific raceways thing on Wednesday, um, track on Thursday, track on Friday, um, local road race on Saturday, a road wow. race or a crit on Sunday, like all the time. There's so much racing. And I was like, I don't ever have to do intervals. I can just, <laughs> I can just go to these races and it, it is training and I'm just burned out so hard. Um, so yeah, you have to pick and choose and disappoint some people and, uh, disappoint some sponsors sometimes and say no, uh, yeah, you have to do it. It's not easy, but you can't do everything. You bring up a really good point because John and I actually have raced every week during the summer. We have this really good local uh, race series in Reno. And it we what we do, though, is we replace one of the – it's a Tuesday night, so we replace that Tuesday night workout. And then John and I have both done this where – so in a crit, normally – you, you, you're going to do as least power as possible to win, right? At least. But before too, we've done these crits so many times, depending on the field, and both of us have won these things in the, in the A field. What we do is we, John will be like, today I'm doing long intervals off the front and it's a workout in that crit. And he's like, I'm going to go out and he just freaking guns it. It's so annoying. And then it'll be like, he <laughs> goes for 10 minutes off the front and then he comes back and he does it again and then comes back. And it's like a workout inside of the actual race. Mm -hmm. Um, but he's not then the next day repeating he's recovering, Definitely right? He's not. not doing the next <laughs> one. So I want to say like that stuff is super fun and racing is fun. And I definitely don't think we're saying, Hey, you can't race until you're a race with the taper. You just <laughs> have to adjust your plan for the volume that you can recover from. And if you go intense doing VO two max and threshold, every single day with, and then races, you're going to have a bad time. Yes. One more tip for the Z2 with the homies. This is not mm -hmm. utilized enough is e-bikes. If you can afford yes. an e-bike, an e-bike with the homies, you can stay in that power zone. <laughs> it is best. amazing. I've done it with John with like a, a mountain bike Two mountain bike e-bikes. Oh my, they're so cool. They feel you can so actually amazing. ride mountain bike terrain and make it recuperative because otherwise it's almost always too steep, you know, oh, it's too steep. And you get to do so many more downhills, which are the fun. And then in that like mental break, you just, it's like, it's like your own chairlift, right? Yeah. And then someone else, you can talk to people. Uh, I can, so I can, I mean, I can drop John on e-bike, which is pretty awesome. He actually goes pretty, pretty close to me still. Uh, <laughs> but that's one of those ones where if John has a hard day, I'm like, Hey, can I come? I have my e-bike. He's like, yeah, sure. And he, he drops me on the descents, but it's super duper fun. Like I know you might say, I mean, you're at 340. People know you're strong. Uh, this is an ego thing. It's cool. It's okay to wear an e-bike. Like mm -hmm. I, I know there's a mental barrier, I think, against some of the like the people who have high fitness. Like I would never need one, but it's a train. It's a tool in your training. Look yeah. at it that way. You're going to become faster. And just I would think you would have the confidence, and you can tell people like, "Hey, I'm going to go zone two. I want to ride with you. I can't stay zone two unless I have an e-bike on this day." Yeah, Amazing. I'll see you. At the, I'll see you on race day if you want to like uh, yeah. make fun of me or something. But I don't think they will. We've, we've said a lot of things and presented a lot of hypotheticals, but I want to have a takeaway, an action item here. If this were me and I was in this scenario and doing all these things and started feeling like I was going to crack, the first thing I would cut out uh, of my calendar would be that Tuesday night race for one week, maybe even two, um, and, and do some workout alternates and short, shorten those weekly workouts um, and see how I'm feeling before I incorporate one of those Tuesday races again. That's what I would do. Adding to that, I would use alternates to, and I, I don't know, perhaps you meant this IV here, but I would use alternates for a little bit to make everything a little bit easier and a little bit shorter in terms of your structured workouts. Just do that for a little bit. Like 
you're, you're fast and you've been doing a lot of training <clears throat> chances are, and then you've been trying to like your glass is full and then you're just like dumping more water on top of it, you know, mm -hmm. right now. So don't worry about turning it down and losing something you won't, you'll just gain by turning things down. Okay. I have, I have more thoughts looking at this calendar, um, mm -hmm. where he has his recovery week. He went outside and did 12 hours and 40 minutes. He had it scheduled four hours. Yeah. And he had 12 hours of riding. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and then his next recovery week. Very common. We're not laughing uh, at you. We're laughing with you. Because he's we all nine hours. This, this yes. is low volume. 12 hours. His next one, he has nine hours of outside riding with a race on his recovery week. Uh, mm -hmm. Two races in a row, actually. Um. And then he jumps back into 13. Remember, this is low volume. Low volume is like two and a half hours. Yeah, three to, so you're <laughs> going to be looking at like three to four oh. hours probably. Yeah. Oh, three to four hours. Plan. Okay, sorry. Yep. Uh, yeah, yeah, th yeah. three and a half is usually the with uh -huh. the first one. So that, so three and a half, you go up to 13. More than There's a difference. your volume. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. You're like, but trainer road's too hard. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, Hannah, I'm sorry. what are you? I'm sorry to pick on you, but this is like, this is so good to hear for I think so many people. Oh yeah. Uh, I, I just, I, I found myself tempted to fall into this before Oceanside, right? Like the week mm -hmm. before I was like, Ooh, I was just sick last week. Maybe I can fit in some extra training here. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? And I had to catch myself. The temptation was there. I think we all do it. Hannah, do you have any final thoughts on this one before we move on to Luca's question? Yeah. I mean, I think that, I think what I'm hearing from everyone that I agree with is this athlete just needs to prioritize a little bit better. Um, and by that, I just, I think that in the process process of prioritizing, they will realize that, um, I think they're a little bit flat all across the board right now. And so they need to prioritize where they want to be fast and work backwards from there. And so realizing that when you're fast is when you're rested. Um, and maybe even, maybe even try that out for a little bit, like the idea of backing off and doing, um, cutting down workouts for a little while, if it makes you nervous, think of it as an experiment and see mm -hmm. what happens. Because I think we're all really confident that if you back it off a little bit and take a true, true, honest recovery week, you will be <laughs> flying at the end of <laughs> yeah. it. And then it's yeah. going to be this thing like, Ooh, I want that back. Um, mm -hmm. and you'll taste a little bit of that good life. And so I think, I think that you just need to give yourself that recovery in order to feel what it feels like to be fresh. And hopefully that gives you new insight into what, um, what you can really achieve. And remember that when you're fresh and you hit those higher numbers, because you are fresh, you're getting more training stimulus. So it's really perpetual in that the harder you can work, the faster you get. And then, but with that is that needed rest component. And so I think right now you're, you're so close, you're willing to work hard, but you're just not resting. You're not completing that circle. And so if you complete that circle with rest, um, it's just going to keep building for you. So rest a little bit, I think is, uh, what we've all been trying to say here. <laughs> I, I see oh, too. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Abby. Oh, I was just going to say, when is his a race? Should he do, do your rest? Just do it now. Do your resting now. <laughs> Start now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Agreed. I, I see too. This athlete is during, they're still doing productive workouts. Like they're doing productive. I see some stretch. They're still progressing. And that's where I think what Hannah just said about being flat it's probably exactly right with a true recovery week. Like the, I don't feel like they're in this huge hole where they need to like take a month off. This mm -hmm. is doable right now. Listen to the last segment. Don't do all these, you know, do the chill stuff to Taku, eat, sleep. And I bet you when you come out, like Hannah said, you're going to be like crushing souls. 100%. Just everyone's goal. Yep. <laughs> Luca's question. Luca says, just got back into train road after listening to your podcast. And after this, by the way, we're going to cyclist fair warning. We're going to cover my, I'm going to, we're going to talk about my triathlon at Oceanside and see how that went. So <laughs> you're saving you're doing it to the, the triathlon. End. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. We didn't know. Uh, <laughs> no, no, sorry. I'm proud of you. Sorry. <laughs> Luca says, uh, just got back into training, uh, into train road after listening to your podcast. Good to have you back with us, Luca. 
Um, I've previously <laughs> burnt out quickly from choosing mid or high volume training programs and not being able to juggle life and training. Recently, I started a low volume program and supplemented it, supplemented it with train now function when I find I have the extra time. And by doing this, I've been able to stay consistent with my training and ultimately my fitness gains are also going up. So thank you. It's amazing. Yes. Um, it's great. So, um, uh, my question of owning multiple sets of, or my question is about owning multiple sets of wheels uh, to change out based on an event. I'm currently tossing up between buying a deeper set of wheels, a 60 millimeter front and a 68 millimeter rear, or a more all rounder set of wheels of a 45 millimeter front and 55 millimeter rear. I understand that due to weight, deeper wheels are generally preferred for flatter courses while shallower wheels for rolling climbing. My question would be around crits and bunch rides. I have heard that shallower wheels provide better accelerations out of corners and for sprints, but would the accumulative watt saving of a deeper wheel mean that I'm fresher for a sprint, so ultimately provide a similar advantage? Thank you for the great podcast. I've given you five stars on Spotify and tell all my friends about you. Thank you, Luca. And if you're listening to this, rating the podcast on Spotify is how you can like pay us, so to speak. Like, like it, it, we would it mean the world. It's free. You don't have to do it, but if you do it, man, it helps us a ton. So go on to Spotify, rate it five stars and share it with people. And the app. The app, yes. our reviews in the app, we have like, 16,000 or like 4.9. Yeah. That's amazing. Yeah. Cause that gives us credibility when people go there. Cause mm, a lot of people still think it's like, Hey, it's the three Ivy John and myself, you know, just like a couple of yeah. people doing this. We have a hundred boys. Comes by, and like, Hannah comes by every once in a while. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Fives in the office. <laughs> Nate, uh, uh, what are your thoughts on this? I mean, you've yes, had I love you wheels. Ran the gamut in terms of wheel. I bought depth. them all. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, uh, but by the way, are people using my wheels or do we sell them? Because someone should use them at Trainer Road. They're... Someone should use them. I don't know. Yeah, I don't, they're sitting around. Yeah. Um, okay, first off, uh, not first off. No, I think, didn't we do this math where the acceleration of watts of the like slightly heavier wheels is not con of consequence? It isn't of consequence. That's correct. Yeah, it is so small. I think your brother did that math. Yeah, uh, who is a like a scientist, literally a rocket <laughs> so, scientist, literally. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so that yeah. is that could be a, um, more in your head on that. And so the rotational weight of that is not a big deal. The one thing is the wind, right? That is an issue. Uh, and maybe if you're in a climb and 100 grams is something. But if you're doing crits, I mean, that's 60, 68. What was my envy? Seven, two, right? I had those. Yeah, uh, yours yeah. were six eights. Yep. So 60, six 80. Yeah. Those, they just look so cool. Nice like you deal. roll up with those people go, go oh, whoosh. this person's going to go fast. whoosh, whoosh when you pedal too. They send the, the sound cool. The, to tell you too, <laughs> the, uh, the cliff bar team with Pete, they do that too. Yeah. It is if they're stiff. So when you take corners too, they feel really good. As long as it's not a super, even a super windy crosswind. I mean, the envies, I did not get that wheel push thing, especially in a crit. You maybe if you're yeah. going 50 down a hill, uh, that's one thing, but in a crit, I, I just love them. Yeah. I always use the deep dish and all of my crits because, you know, those little five watts at 30 miles per hour that you might save um, in a sprint is enough to get that extra half wheel or something or that quarter wheel. So I would definitely go for those. Uh, I, mean, I would definitely go for those. And then for road, I would usually do the, um, I would do the, the NV, what is it? 50 in the front and. Yep. Five sixes, I think is what you're yeah. Yep. Five. Yep. Yeah. Yep. And I like those for road and I don't even. That was mostly for like wind stuff and and mm -hmm. scared, but I'd go up big climbs and stuff too. I don't really know if that was actually faster than the six eights, but yeah, yeah. The Anyways, general that's what I like. The general consensus that you see is somewhere around fifty for being like the average depth that <clears> most <throat> people use in road races and in crits. It tends to be a bit deeper. Uh, I uh, the advice that I would give on this one is that a shallower wheel is only like like when we're talking like below forty. The only reason that you would be using that is if you have people protecting you. So then you're riding in a draft so that the aerodynamic drag doesn't matter as much and that you plan to place a move on a climb where that is absolutely your move. Like that, that's your ticket to winning the race or achieving whatever outcome you have. Then you would build up your equipment for that. In all other circumstances, I think it makes sense to go somewhere around 50 mil. Now, in your case, you're debating between 50 and 60. And I would just go towards 60. In most cases, it's actually between those two wheels. If you look at it, it's like 40 to 80 watts or 80 grams of difference in terms of weight. It's a really small amount of weight. 
so because of that, it's really not a big deal. Um, and especially if you're the sort of rider that's also going to be carrying with the field and it's not dealing with constant surges or anything else, but you won't notice the weight of the surges. You just build it up in your head. It's all kind of like a fake thing. Hannah, I see you nodding. I don't know if you have uh, experience or insight on that. I just think that, um, <laughs> I just think that as cyclists in general, we are, <laughs> we tend to overthink some of these things. Um, and if it's fun for you, like if this is a fun question, which when I read it, that was kind of, I thought I was like, Ooh, this is fun to think about, um, you know, where are you getting the most advantage? But if you're genuinely concerned about this, the reality of the situation is, you know, it, it's really not that big of a difference. Probably, probably the thing that is impacting you the most is thinking about it. And if you're thinking about it to the point that you're getting to the race and looking around of, well, what does that person have? What does that person have? That doubt and question is impacting you way more than the wheels that you actually have. So have fun thinking about it, but word to the wise would just be, um, once you make your decision, you're all in, be confident in it. Don't look around. Don't question it. Don't wonder if you bought the right wheels. You did no matter what you bought, you bought the right ones. They're yours and you'll be fast on them. Yeah. Well said. So how, John, how John said the 40 to 60 grams thing. Uh, I know there's rotational weight and we did that math before, but your 16 ounce water bottle, just the water is 450 grams. Yeah. Right. So if you're like, yeah. I, you know, you might be putting two bottles on only drink one and you're getting that extra pound the whole time. And you don't even think about that. Right. But you're like, Oh, 60 grams. I don't know. It's <laughs> yeah. going to slow me down. Uh, <laughs> totally. Shoot. Yeah. yeah. Uh, the, the, I, I would prioritize. I think you're looking at the wrong measurement, Luca. The more important thing is the internal width of your rim. If you can look at the internal width, you want to go with a wider wheel. And I know a lot of older wheels are going to be somewhere between 19 to 21 or, nine, or closer to 19 millimeters internal width. Modern ones are going to be 21 to 23, even up to 25 in some cases on some road wheels you'll see. The wider you can be, it's going to allow you to run less pressure, larger volume tires, and you're going to decrease your rolling resistance substantially. And then it also means that since most tires now are coming out as 25s and above in terms of size, if you have a rim that's going to be 21, 23, or 25 millimeter internal width, the tire is going to match those new fancy tires that are going to be faster. They're going to match the profile of your rim really well. So then you're going to get more aerodynamic benefit because if you have 80 mil depth wheels, but you're running a 28 and they're really skinny rims, you've completely nullified like the effect of having a deep dish wheel anyway, because you have this big mismatch between the tire diameter and your rim. So, um, I would go toward whatever is wider on the internal width Ivy. Uh, what say you? Uh, I, I ride wheels. I have big wheels. <laughs> big wheel go whoosh whoosh. I have yeah. them, yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, like, I'm the kind of person that has, like, I won Land Park last year on aluminum training wheels, you know? Like, um, like Hannah said, the wheels that you have are the right wheels. <laughs> yeah. For sure. Look, in yeah. cycling, there's That's always... Yeah, I'm yeah. <laughs> just like, yeah, whatever. I was on my Huffy. Yeah. My, I mean, it just, on. you know, you can, I, I've i known riders and have raced with riders that, uh, you know, I really admire people that know so much about equipment and, um, or, you know, are curious about equipment in this way. But there's also uh, a negative part of that where you can mentally like wonder if it's, affecting your performance and kind of let it be a roadblock to you when instead your mentality could be like, this works, like I'm gonna make this work and put all these other pieces together, you know, in the scope of like we're saying before, mis misdiagnosing or misattributing where stuff goes wrong. Um, you could find little gains here and there, or you could have gotten an extra hour of sleep or like not miss that workout this week or, you know, um, so it's hard for me to want to I can't fixate on equipment stuff because there's such, you know, there's so much more lower hanging fruit that results in a better race for me. Well and look, in, in cycling, there's always, always, always a way to make equipment improvements. Um, and that's part of what's so fun about it. Right. And so addicting, mm -hmm. but also, you know, if wheels are stressful, if they're expensive, if it's hard to change, like 
are you running a skin suit? Because that's a huge aerodynamic mm-hmm. um, difference, like a slightly more aero helmet, aero socks. Like there are some really small gains that especially when we're sitting here talking about what did Nate say? 40 or 60 grams. Yeah. Um, gosh, you can make that back in so many other ways that uh, they're fun and maybe less expensive. So just, you know, in some ways, don't worry about it. In other ways, widen your perspective and recognize that there's a million ways you can make up that deficit. Mm-hmm. Uh, two. So I love NB wheels. I love them, right? They're, mm-hmm. they're not cheap. MB wheels six, seven is one, two thousand eight hundred fifty dollars uh, yeah. for trainer road. That is 15 years of trainer road. <laughs> we haven't been around that way. <laughs> and so I know people are like, ah, oh, you're too expensive. I guarantee you <laughs> just over that 15 years, we're going to give you way more than the, like the five Watts of air. <laughs> but probably in a month, we will get you that extra, depending on where you are in your, in your, uh, yeah. in your journey. But, uh, don't sleep on that. Like that's a, I still think we're for dollars spent. Nothing makes you faster than trainer. Sure. Oh yeah, absolutely. And that's my opinion as the co-founder and CEO. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, there we go. Go to trainerroad.com, sign up and get faster. Um, uh, can we get into some triathlon stuff to close it out? Can't Talk wait. about how the race went. I'm excited. <laughs> what, should we just start with questions how do we start i always feel bad talking about myself did, um yeah did you survive yeah I, i'm here yep I'm here. i survived you... uh they changed the swim just for me so they made it so that we didn't have to swim in the in the waves instead we just swam in the harbor or the marina um well, can i just walk you through because i i think i'm the only triathlete here right uh, no, Hannah. No, Hannah. Hannah has, Hannah has an ITU. I, yeah. yeah. What? I, raced, I did not know you this. You didn't know this. I raced triathlon for I raced triathlon for eleven years. Um, that's Whoa. how I started in sport. I won Never mind. Xterra, yeah, I won Xterra Worlds for overall amateurs two times. What? I didn't know all of it. <laughs> Hannah's just like, <laughs> man. <laughs> okay, Hannah, take it away. Like interview John. I'm just gonna sit back and learn myself. Oh my god. <laughs> yeah, that's how I started sport. Um yeah. Yeah. So overall world champion. (laughs) (laughs) No, legit. (laughs) I mean, okay. So Jonathan has graced us with an amazing spreadsheet here. So I'm looking at some things and I immediately have some comments. Um, but the first thing I just want to hear is like, Oh yeah. I'll I'll post it in the forum. I'll post the spreadsheet and then I'll post my nutrition spreadsheet and my pacing spreadsheet, all that stuff. I'll post them all in there. Thank you. Sorry, Hannah. I was thinking, for, by the no. way, sorry, on the wheels thing before, I was like, I was going to give a suggestion, but it'd probably make a person like fret over this even more. But everything I do, I break down cost per gram on my bikes. And I also break down oh for goodness. aero stuff, like cost per gram, and then also per cost per watt saved. So then I can actually pay attention. Like, are the wheels I'm worth like spending all this money on, are they worth it? Or should I just bend my elbows like and drop my something that, you know, like, <laughs> yeah. So anyways, yeah. Um, lots of spreadsheets. Sorry, Hannah. No, I just, um, first of all, congratulations. You finished. That's amazing. <laughs> you, uh, and you made it through the swim. That's even more amazing. So I want to focus on, I want to go through each element of the try, but I also, I know you posted on Instagram beforehand that you wanted to go sub five because you said five is just a, over five is just a little too long. And you did end up in five Oh seven. So you're <laughs> close, but you're a little, a little bit over that goal. What uh, do you no. feel like put you over the top there? Uh, there's a lot. Um, so in this spreadsheet, it actually broke down. So my transitions were, were really slow. Um, so first, like when I got out of the water, so the swim was, uh, like a pure, like, just like you're doing like threshold work and you're like floating up and you find that spot where if you go anymore, you're going to blow up. That was me, but with panic attack on the swim mm. the whole time. Right. Like, so I was just pinging off that limiter, so to speak, like the whole time. And I couldn't really focus on swimming fast. Instead, I was just moving through and not panicking to the point where I needed to stop. And the only time I needed to stop um, was the time because there were just so many people. The only time I needed to stop was because I literally swam into a wall of people. Uh, I don't know what happened, but everybody just stopped. And instead of the feet kicking and the water splashing in front of me, it suddenly just stopped. And I swam into them. That was the only time I needed to stop. And that was really big for me to not have a panic attack that was going to cause me to have to just stop tread 
backstroke, hold on to something. I never had to do any of that. And that was like, so I, but it, it took its toll. And that transition, I think is where it shows because I was just like, it was like, I was in a car accident. And then once I got out, I was just like, okay, bring yourself back down, collect yourself. Like, you know, and it took quite a while. So I, John too, it, during the, this is kind of a silly question, but are, is your fear during swimming drowning? No, it's like subconscious because, mm -hmm. you know, I'm, I, and I don't know what it is, right, Nate? Like, because I get into the water and I float like a cork. Uh, I have my wetsuit on and I'm in salt water. It's like crazy. It's like, you're, you're so buoyant. Mm -hmm. So no, it's not. I think that it's probably tied to like past trauma as a kid with being dunked by that swim instructor over and over and over and over for like weeks on end. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that I've still been trying to overcome that, but anytime it's just like, you know, when you're in the water, facing the water, swimming like that, it's like this subconscious reaction and it's hard to calm it down. And I've made a huge amount of progress because a huge amount, but still it's there, you know? Well, I want to share something. Feel like, Go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, what do you feel like has allowed the greatest amount of progress simply time in the water or have you employed specific strategies? Time in the water like a deconditioning this response that I have and doing it gradually also doing it like just time in the water. I don't mean like I just go out and spend four hours in the water. Like at first I had to just take a break halfway through a lane. And mm -hmm. then after that, it was take a break at the end of a lane. And I might only, and at first I remember I swam way too long. My first time it was pretty rough and traumatic. And then after that, I remember going to the pool and swimming 10 minutes. And honestly, that was all I, could tolerate without getting to the point where I was like too revved up, you know? And, and so just took a lot of gradual exposure and deconditioning. Um, this might help other people, it might not help you, John, but, but so for me, I would in a race, I don't have the fear of that, but when I swim in open water by myself, I do have the fear. Cause I'm always like, what if I get in trouble? There's nothing, no one around to help me. And there is a device that is legal to use in races. It's a little belt. It should be a little bit of drag, but it's it's pretty um, close to you. And you can pull something and a little inflating device will come up. Uh, DC Rainmaker covered this. It works really well. And I think it's just, if you are swimming in open water by yourself, it should be a requirement. Um, I agree with that. For, like, yeah. for loved ones and stuff. But in a race too, if that is your fear, I think, because you know, it's mental, right? All of this stuff is mental. Mm -hmm. And if that does give you any more of like, hey, I have, I am, I am safe right now. Uh, that could help somebody. And I don't know how much it costs and I don't remember the exact name, even the forum. If I bet if someone asked in the forum on this thread, someone else would link you to it, but yep. I would totally use one of those again, open water all the time, but in a, a race, I would not be, don't be ashamed or anything like that. And if anyone gives you shit about it, like, or excuse me, uh, you can look at the rules and it is allowed as like a safety device. It doesn't give you advantage. Of course, if you pull it, you're out, you're out. Like you can't use sure. it anymore, but better than drowning. You know? 100%. Yeah. 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 And that's then the hard thing to, to reckon with is I figured it was drowning. Like, and I was like, yeah, that's what I'm afraid of. But no, it's just like this, like can, this hardwired connection that's been really tough to, to reverse. But this is a huge Ooh. amount of progress for me. I don't want to make people think that like, I'm, uh, I'm disappointed with that. I thought I'd swim 35 to 40 minutes. I swam 41 and that's like, Hey, that's like that's great for me for, yeah for that sort of scenario. Yeah. It was way slower than what I swim in a pool, but I got through it, it without having is. a panic attack. So John, and, and that is pretty good. And one more tip too, for people who have that like past trauma stuff and all parts of your lives, there is a technique called EMDR, seeing a therapist, and it can help you work through some of that stuff so that it kind of melts away over time. And you don't have that same trauma response um, that worth looking into for anyone who wants to do that. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I can help you find a therapist in, in Reno that will walk you through EMDR. That'd be awesome. I would appreciate that. Yeah. yeah. Well, and also in, in terms of swim times in a race, I've always found that swim times in open water are super hard to compare race to race mm -hmm. because of the amount of people there, because um, not all the courses are always exactly perfect. Even if they are perfect with sighting, sometimes you'll swim a little bit further um, and Current, uh, yeah. currents of course, too. Like, yeah. I mean, in some races more than others and that like escape from Alcatraz, which is famous for the currents, the slowest I've done that is like 45 minutes. And the fastest I did, it was like 20. Um, wow. so that's all due to currents. So 
yeah, it's just, I think that if you were even close to the time that you set as your goal, mm-hmm. I think it's a win, major win. So that's awesome. Yeah. And you're overall out of everyone else. You were not, you were like, you're overall, were you in the middle or like the 75th percentile? In terms of the percentile? overall time of the race or just the swim? Just the swim. Uh, I was like toward the, I was toward the front half. Um, I was like probably somewhere around Amen. 30, 40th percent somewhere around. That there. is amazing, John. That's Your exterior, amazing. You were like dead last, were you? Yeah. A huge, huge change. That's huge, huge change. Going from the hundredth percentile or no, the zero percentile to yeah. halfway through I, that, John, you should be so proud of the work that you've done to, to do that. And this is more competitive field by far than the Xterra mm-hmm. one. A hundred percent. So it's even better. Yeah. So kudos to you, John. Thank you. Yeah. yeah, I'm I'm quite proud of it. I know it's okay. maybe not like you know some crazy fast time, but I'm really proud of the progress. It's huge. Let's talk about T1, Amazing. Hannah. You you, yeah. you 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 give him poo poo for this. <laughs> man, John, this T1. I saw this and I just thought, man, it better better have been a mile run in T1. <laughs> it was long. I'll say this much. It was long, but yeah, as soon transition as I thought, times. Like, Transition times will sometimes vary a lot because sometimes the transition area is huge and you'll run across the mat and then you'll have to run almost a half mile to your bike. So, you know, give or take a little bit on what the quote unquote average time is for T1. Uh, But Jonathan's T1 was nine minutes and 26 (laughs) seconds. So giving you some, (laughs) giving you some context, I thought there's no way after the race, I was like, yeah, but there's no way anybody went under like five minutes in T1. And I think that the winner, Leo uh, um, Bajer, I think that he did it in two minutes and 27 seconds. He's like an ITU like mm-hmm. beast. Um, mm-hmm. But, and he smoked the rest of them. But if you look at the average time in T1 for my, for the top 10 of my age group, it's eight minutes and 32 seconds. Okay. So that's what they. Wait. No. Or six minutes and 32 seconds. I think I touched I, it wrong. I see the top five people all in like the 430s. Yes, they're fast, but I'm looking at top 10 in my age group. The, the nice thing too is about with the the the, the, the um, transitions. And for those who don't know, the T1 means the transition between the bike, uh, I mean, sorry, the swim and the bike. And they time that portion. So you have to, you know, change. Is anyone can be super fast. It's not a fitness thing. It's like an organization, like, can I take my wetsuit off quickly? It doesn't have anything to do with the fitness. Uh, there's someone who 30th place, no, what is it? 10th place did a 418. So we're just saying, let's say is the average, forgive me. 432 is the average that they have. Okay, cool. So but I'm just I'm saying double. John lost about four and a half minutes right there. Yes. Which is crazy. So how did, why was it so long? Um, it was over a quarter mile run total that you did like, uh, going or all like going all the way down transition and then all the way out and to my bike, um, and then from the bike kind of out in a weird angle. But anyways, the main thing, the reason that it took so long is because I was just rocked, right? Like in terms of like emotionally trying to get myself to calm down. So I was jogging through, not running through, um, just jogging through because I was like, just mind somewhere else. Once I got into transition, it went fairly quick. I I'd like to look at getting some different shoes, like try shoes. If I was to do another half. That would be helpful. Um, I have S works ones and the boa laces, they easily pop out of the little clip that holds them. Right. And it's like a feature, not a bug. It's like what they're supposed to be. But for triathlon, if you're putting those onto your bike, it's a little tricky to then make sure that that boa lay or that boa cable stays in. If you're going to put your foot in, it's really easy for it to pop out. And I tried it uh, before the race a few times and uh, more than half the time I would go to put my foot in and it would knock the lace out of there. And then I'd have to stop and then put the shoe on with two hands. Cause it's really tricky. So I put those shoes on, but I put socks on because I have dignity. No, I'm just joking. But also cause it was freezing cold. It was 43 degrees that morning when we started swimming and then the water was 52 degrees. Um, so really cold and it was windy, um, when we <sighs> headed out. So it was freezing cold. So I put on socks and then I put on arm warmers as well, but Honestly, I think that the majority of it was just because I wasn't focused on being fast in transition. I was focused on trying to be calm. And I was worried that my nerves would cause me to forget my nutrition or forget something else, you know? And so I just kind of took my time through it. I figured it's okay. All, you know, I'm, I'm not here to set a specific time and just here to have a good day with the performance. So sorry. I don't know anything about, (laughs) about try, uh, nutrition when you say like, focusing on nutrition in the transition, are you like eating 
do you eat gels or something there? Like, do you have a little fanny pack with, I really don't understand how you're, no, I'm serious. I like, when do you eat? Yeah. Um, so in transition, I have planned to take in uh, a piece of run gum. I did not want to take caffeine before the swim. I was going to be revved up enough, but, uh, taking a piece of run gum. And then in addition to that, take down a gel. And then I also had a bottle in transition that had like a really strong electrolyte mix. So then I could just like take a swig of that if I needed as well. So I did that. Um, so that's what I did while I'm heading out and, you know, getting changed and doing all that stuff. Uh, Ivy, that's how you do it. The, like this, for those who haven't done it, when you get gassed on the swim, that run feels so disorienting. You can get water in your ears too. You can be dizzy as you run. I ran then, earplugs, by the way, to avoid that. Cause in the first try, I fell over like three times in transition because of just, that's yeah, it was really ago. smart. Uh, and then when you're running too, the ability to try to, some people take their wetsuit off, like, um, pull it down to their waist. Mm -hmm. I really like that because you can also get really heated quickly. Yes. I know that was a cold day, but running with your wetsuit on, and it just feels really weird too, to, um, to get up there and do that. And then, um, what you said is, John, were you saying you had your, your pedals clipped in, your, your shoes clipped in? I was going to do that, and I tried it before the race a few times, and it did not work well with the shoes that I have. Yeah, If you're going to do that, you good. definitely want the try shoes. One, for the way they close, but also they have the little um, loop on the back of the shoe, usually. which the rubber like, bands? Yeah, because then you can put rubber band on the shoe and put a rubber band. It attaches somewhere on your bike, and then once your feet are in, you pedal, and the rubber bands just snap. Um, yep. so yeah, sometimes if you want to put your, what? Sometimes, <laughs> sometimes they, don't. they don't, you gotta <laughs> get a really thin one. Like I've had down. it where it doesn't. And you're like, Oh no. Um, <laughs> yeah. You have to like but, reach down or something. But. So John is a, you know, national level bike handler for sure. Yeah. And he had problems with that. And I would say for anyone starting out, I wouldn't do this for at least a year unless you're practicing a ton, because two, you're going to get in that position where you come out of the bike. There's so many people around you. And if you have a, a single problem, you have to reach down or something. You swerve a little bit. I've seen so many crashes. Hannah, have you seen this too? Right mm -hmm. out of it. People end their whole races because of that. Um, yes. And the, on the other side, you see people pedaling on their shoes, like stay clear of them, right? Um, probably at the front of the race, they're all really good. But at the back of the race, there's a bunch of people who are not... Um, skilled enough to do this. And I honestly, I don't think it's that much faster. Mm -hmm. Um, if you want to be in a, in a group maybe, but because you start off slower because you still have to put your shoes in the guy next to me in transition, I think he qualified for worlds, uh, in the 25 to 30 age group. Um, he's very fast and he didn't do this with his shoes. So he had his shoes just off. He put his shoes on, then ran out in his shoes, uh, just like normal. He didn't have them in position. So even fast people, don't do it sometimes. But yeah, um, I lost a ton in transition. Hannah, Hannah has something I, give, I have okay. something too. I want to give a couple of pro tips for transition here. So actual pro. If you're, yeah. Yeah. So if you're gonna do um if you're gonna do the socks, uh, and I don't know if Jonathan did this or not, but you don't want to just have your socks laying in transition very slow. You want to scrunch them up like they're already ready to be put on, and then you want to put baby powder inside of them because when you slide it on your foot, the baby powder will help dry whatever um, wetness you still have from the swim where the sock would get bunched up and be difficult to put on. And then if you don't do socks, you can just put baby powder straight in your shoes. So same thing, so that it's fast to put on. Um, and then for the food, my recommendation would actually be to get on the bike and then eat, because at least you're moving forward. Um, yes. but the problem with that is people forget, they get so excited when they're on the bike. So if it's eat in transition or don't eat at all, definitely eat in transition. But I think now that you've accomplished this first race and you've worked through it, I think a next step could be just eating on the bike. Um, and then the last thing I would say, and this is not quite as fast, but I think it's a comfort thing that's really good is a lot of the time when you get out of the swim, especially for these longer races, like a half, you'll run on the sand, then you'll run through like a parking lot or something, and then you'll get into transition and your feet are just covered with all this junk. Um, yeah. And the idea of putting on a sock or a shoe, and then you're going to ride and then you're going to run. And I've definitely had it where I've then run on a little pebble um, the entire rest of the race. And it oh. is so uncomfortable. And so what I would like to have in transition is actually just a water bottle 
a, like bike bottle so you can spray it full of water and just really quick grab it spray both feet and then put on the shoes because it just oh, takes bro. away whatever the might cause tip. a blister later in the race yeah we had to run across like a frozen rough parking lot with like gravel and rocks in it and it was pretty terrible so yeah. i had like a tiny little rag that i brought just for my feet. So then I could just like use that to clean my feet off really quick, but it didn't work that, that well. I had socks. I should have done the baby powder, but I did that exact thing with the socks. Um, so that you rolled them up. Yeah. I rolled them up so that it was basically, I, I put it over my toes. And after that, I just moved my hand up my leg and then they, it went right on. Did you ever practice T1 by yourself? Mm. Uh, no, not enough. Um, I practiced it. Jeez. No, it, it's been since the summer since I practiced it because um, of just not swimming to the bike with how freezing cold it's been here. I should have just done it at mock inside the house. Having the confidence Absolutely. to do that. <laughs> like how long would it take to, to take four minutes off your run? Right. Well, be, that would take a, a long time to take four than... minutes off a half marathon time. But for the transitions, like you're right in the house, that could literally be a recovery day issue. I think that would be fine totally. just to like put your wetsuit on, take it off, put my shoes on. To, One thought you know, I have on this too, with these long runs out of there, or first of all, thanks to the volunteer that helped me unzip my wetsuit, like my arms, like just were not working. My whole body yeah. wasn't working. It was really kind of them to help that. They didn't have wetsuit peelers or anything at this race. Just somebody knew what they were doing and helped, which was cool. But it's such a long run that your wetsuit kind of dries out a bit by the time I got to my bike. And, uh, I noticed that when I was taking it off my legs, a drier wetsuit, it's kind of hard to take off. Like, mm -hmm. and, uh, that was one thing that mm -hmm. I thought of, like, it might've even been helpful for me to just like strip my wetsuit and just run through because it was such a long run to my bike. And I could just like put the wetsuit over my shoulder or something or carry it. You know what I mean? Like, and it would probably be fine. But anyways, that was, that was one thought uh, that I had on, on that, but it was a really slow transition. I could have saved a ton of time, a lot of places. So, uh once you got on the bike, how much better did you feel versus oh. the swim? Cause you're at it's home now. Like, I was yeah, going to and... say, now we get to talk about the bike where you're like, we're, we've entered expert place. Yeah. Of the triathlon. <laughs> I, I subconsciously, like I realized that my body subconsciously used the familiarity of that to recover. Cause during transition, I didn't feel like I was recovering, but then when I was on the bike, like my body was in such a familiar motion. I was just like, you're home. I was, I was home. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. Um, but I had like a really, uh, strict, like, or really clear plan. It was, I should have my, um, I should have my normalized power around 210 Watts by the end of it. But if I'm riding on the flats, I should be holding somewhere between 200, 210. If it's like a slight downhill or anything like that, I should be somewhere between 180 to 190. And if it was like a slight rise, I should allow myself to go up to 240 to 260. And if it's a steep climb, I can go up to 290. And according to best bike split, that was the way to pace it. So it, it broke down that. And I was within one watt of that. And also wow. like within like 30 seconds of the time or something um, that it predicted. <clears throat> Sorry, one more thing before, the, before Hannah takes over the bike. The amount of cortisol and adrenaline that John experienced during that race, during the swim, is a significant factor for the rest of the race. And that ability to someday get more and more calm. Like, I don't think people realize that enough that it's not just the, the swimming part of it. Like if John swam this in a pool, he probably would have had so been so much more relaxed and be able to put out more power the rest of the race. Sure. Um, versus that. And it's okay. And that happens to, unless you're like a high school, like little kid swimmer, this happens to everybody. Mm -hmm. And it's something you can get over though. And something you can For work sure. through. Yeah. Agreed. Yeah. And the bike was just like constant passing people. And honestly, it's pretty uneventful in the sense that like, I was just rolling through people. Um, I'm not sure I ever got past uh, because it was, was really slow. far back in the swim. Yeah. Um, and then, <laughs> whenever, uh, whenever someone says that it's because their swim, like the swim I was, was the last person, no one passed me. It was weird. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I just, how do you feel like the pacing worked for you? Oh, it, it was like quite conservative. Um, but I also don't feel like it was, if I had gone any harder, my run would have suffered. Um, mm. so I feel like it was actually for me with this distance being the first time I've done this race, it was like the right, uh, sort of thing. Uh, I did, um, if there were way more people than I anticipated that would be on course for way more of the course. <clears throat> and it caused like, like in one situation, we're going up and down a slight climb. And when we're going back down, uh, I'm telling people on your left and I'm out of the, 
I'm not in the arrow position here because there's too many people and it's two-way traffic going up this road. It's not safe for me to be down there. Um, and I had said on your left and to one person, I think that they meant, I think that they heard move left or something. Mm -hmm. They moved left and I had the choice of like hitting mm -hmm. people because TT brakes or TT bikes with rim brakes have terrible brakes. So I had the choice of hitting people going down or swerving and then hopefully not hitting anybody going up. And that seemed like a better option, but I hit a gigantic manhole and I thought I was going to blow up my wheel, oh, gosh. but it tossed one of my bottles in the frame. So that was the only like a uh, moment where on the bike, I was like, there's a problem. And even then my backup plan was just to go to an aid station and get four gels and then water. And if I could get four gels and water, that would make up for the carbs that I had in that bottle. So I did that and everything was fine and th there was nothing, no other issues. Good job, but, good job recovering yeah. on that. That can freak mm -hmm. people out. And one, one important thing, I left that bottle and I feel bad about leaving that bottle. I hope that they picked it up, but it was not safe for me to stop, play mm -hmm. Frogger with yeah. the traffic and pick up that bottle. Like it would that have, happens. I would have made people crash. It would have yeah. been really dangerous. Hannah, that's not a thing. People don't stop and then go run across the course to pick up bottles when, when they get ejected, right? It's not safe. And I think that. I think that what's really frowned upon is purposefully littering, you know, like mm -hmm. if someone takes a gel and then just throws that, that's not cool. Don't do that. Um, but when there's a mistake and something that happens, safety is really, is really first mm -hmm. priority. So I think what Jonathan did is, is correct. Yeah. Uh, but I have two specific questions for the bike. So the first cool. one is, um, a lot of people when they race triathlon, they're usually coming from another sport, like one of the three. Um, and they feel like, that's the place to make up their best time. Like I'm going to yeah. survive the swim, crush the bike and then survive the run. Uh, based on your experience, I just want to hear you kind of talk about that mindset, how you handled that, how you did or didn't do that. Yeah. Um, yeah. That was super far from my mindset and my plan. I made a plan to avoid that. Otherwise I would have fallen into it. So it was like a pretty, but I had to build that plan beforehand and have confidence that it was the right one. So it, it never felt hard, right? It just felt, and it just felt like I was riding at that kind of like normal level. The power was really low just because of where my fitness is. Like typically holding 250 Watts on that course would be chill. Like that would be fine. And I would be able to continue and just have a great run. But in this case, it was holding 212, I think is the Watts that I had or 211 at the end. So that's what it was, but no, I didn't try to kill it. I didn't try to make up time. That's a trap that I knew was going to bite me. Like I've interviewed enough really good triathletes now over the years that like, um, I've at least been able to see like, uh, that I shouldn't fall into that trap. So it was, it was quite easy. That's what I was going to say, John, like how much power would you hold at Cape Epic for a day? To, like two fifty to two or two forty to two sixty five for three to, or for four to five hours every day. Exactly. And I was very surprised with your power on this and I was worried I thought you went too conservative, but are you saying because of like the new baby, the yeah. training, your power I'm just 40 watts, I'm 40 Watts lower than what I mm. typically am right now, just in terms of uh, power output. I'm just not fast. Yeah. And, and that took a lot of humble pie to be like, geez, I guess I'm just going to ride it to 11, but you know what? That's what I needed to do. And that's like what my fitness allowed me to do. So, you know, you put that out of your mind and then it ends up resulting in a much better day. I think you can still go a little faster. I pro yeah, I certainly could have gone faster, but I didn't know what that would do to the run. And that yeah, was like the main concern. This is the first time I've seen John pace something slower than he could have uh, <laughs> in, in his life. Yeah. <laughs> Hannah, Hannah, you have stuff to say. Yeah, well, and that that's my second question is, did because you paced it so well, did, were you able to just pace it perfectly and then lead into the run? Or did you alter anything else about your ride in order to anticipate that run? Uh, for example, go easier in the last 10 minutes or increase the cadence or anything like that. No, I was like, I just steady as she goes, just stuck with the plan. And I wasn't charging at the end. I wasn't doing anything like that or changing it up. Um, my cadence, I think my average cadence, I don't know what it was, but it was probably somewhere around like 80 to not 85 to 90, somewhere around there. So um, it was kind of typical, like 90 RPM on a bike is going to be 180 RPM on a run, that sort of thing in terms of cadence, uh, what you would transfer over. And I typically run 185 ish, 180 to 185. So no, I didn't adjust anything. Like the bike was super uneventful. It was just good. Um, the one I was an arrow anytime I was above 14 miles an hour. Uh, if I was, or if I felt wind and was below 14 miles an hour, I was in arrow. But other than that, I was in arrow the whole time and that was comfortable and fine. 
I think my position though could be optimized for aerodynamics. Like I made it way more comfortable, but I think I'm I'm like just average aerodynamics instead of like dolphin aerodynamics now. So, you know, but anyways, it's, it's a balance though. Comfortable is good. Yeah. And for then sure. you're, how was your T2? It looks like it was much faster than T1, probably because you were coming from a comfortable place. Yeah. So three minutes, 27 seconds. How did that go? Yeah, it was way closer to the average and I didn't lose a lot of time. I was faster in trans in T2 actually than some of the people that beat me in my age group, which was cool. But the um, I used speed laces uh, um, and I was using alpha flies uh, for the shoes and I used speed laces and they, they kind of hurt my foot. It didn't really bother me in the race. Like I could feel the pain there, but there was other pain that was more important than that. Um, but yeah, like afterward, my feet were like bruised and I didn't have them tight. Mm -hmm. It's just, they're kind of like, uh, they're round and they're, they kind of sit on top of each other and they pressed onto the top of my foot in the spot. So if anybody has, uh, like a line on, on speed laces that aren't round like that, that are flat, that would be cool listeners. If you have an idea, but mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, uh, it was quick. I nailed a gel. I took a swig of my water and dropped my water bottle. And I was running while I did that stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, and then I took in some run gum and everything just like the nutrition plan for the, for the bike and for the run was just a, exactly as planned and through transition too. So it was fast. I wore a hat, I wore a hat backwards zone and sunburn on my face. If you can join on YouTube, you can see that. So you wore that, uh, helmet that you had never worn before until race day. Oh, How'd yeah. that work out? <laughs> Worked out great. Yeah. Yeah. It was actually good. Uh, zero issue. Uh, felt way more, honestly, I felt way more comfortable. I always felt scared wearing like that POC one that I had. The foam is so thin. The Giro is literally three times thicker in terms of foam, like when it has MIPS safer. too, right? And it has MIPS and it way yeah. more coverage too. Like the POC like sat on top of your head kind of, and the yeah. Giro really fits. So that's a, a huge thing. People as a guy who has 24 stitches in his face, where the helmet sits is so important. And I, you know, I, when this is a mountain bike one, I could have had a helmet that just covered a little bit more and I would have saved a can, at least a concussion as bad. Sure. The coverage on your face matters so much. We we worry about again twenty grams, forty grams. Yeah, yeah. Uh, your head, it the, the amount, the impact of a uh, like my three concussions have had on my life has been so not worth forty grams a second on a climb. You know, something like that. Hundred uh, percent. I've, I've always focused. I'm just saying. Some people get some pretty skimpy helmets for weight. Yeah, for sure. Yep. Yeah. So I was happy with that. And yeah, transition went well. T2 went well. So, so then going out on the run, I, I feel like that's one of the hardest parts mentally in the race. How did you feel starting that run and just walk us through the run in general? I felt like, uh, not like, wow, I feel amazing, but I felt good and instantly wanted to run faster than I wanted. But I had this plan of just starting out at seven because typically in bricks, I come off the bike and six, 15, six feels like fine until it doesn't. And then I blow up. So in this case, I forced myself to run at seven and I instantly got like passed by like three people coming out of transition. And then I passed them back seriously within three minutes. And then I never got passed on the run. I, the I had one good battle with another guy, but that was it. Um, but never got like passed after that. And I just, I tried to hold seven at every aid station. I grabbed, uh, one cup or four cups of water at every aid station, basically. So I would grab one, pour it over my head, grab another, pour it over like my torso and my legs, and then grab another and pour it over my back. And then the other one I would drink and that drink would help me take down a salt capsule. And I took down salt capsules every half hour. And in addition to that, I also took down uh run gum halfway through the run and then gels. I was taking in every half hour as well. I ended and did up with you walk the aid stations like you planned. I had planned to, and no, I didn't end up like, uh, I didn't need to. And I'm not sure it would have been faster that way either, because I had this pace and then toward the end of it, I was really afraid to let go of this pace and drop below it at all, because I was afraid I wouldn't be able to find it again. And it was like seven minutes was what I was holding on to. And I think I did seven Oh eight or seven Oh seven, uh, at the end of it, like really close. And at the end I was starting to fall off and the last six miles were brutal. Like it was really hard to hold the pace. And I think that's how it should feel, right? Like yes. the last half, you yeah, should definitely. feel like whatever pace you're trying to hold on to, it's just killing you. And, and and every step is just getting harder and harder, but it's not to the point where you need to stop. And that was what I, that was the the perception I had the whole time. That aid station walking thing too, at the Ironman races, the aid stations are so long that you mm -hmm. have more time where some of the shorter, like the smaller races, they're literally just like one table. 
And if you yeah. don't stop to walk, you, 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 you get one cup, maybe of some, somebody holding it out. Uh, John, how much, how many grams per hour were you going for? Or did you do on the run of carbs? Cause that can be I hard planned, to digest carbs. Yeah. I had planned for 90 over the course of the day. And then, so a bit more on the bike and then a bit less on the run. So I was going to be taking an 80 on the run. I ended up doing 97 overall and zero gut distress. So I did more than that. Yes. And in the swim or sorry, in the run, I took in 90. So it ended up balancing nice. out like, uh, uh, pretty well. So, and zero gut distress. I was super surprised because I was testing gels with running beforehand and everything else. And I had gut distress. So that's why I backed it off a bit in terms of my plan, but yeah, it was great. It was killer. Any bathroom felt so good stops? Zero bathroom stops too, <laughs> which is great. Those are the, those are the worst. Funny that I just peed or pooed <laughs> on my bike. <laughs> I when do John, that, so. <laughs> John posted on Instagram, like ask your questions. And I, I didn't think he would post it, but he did. But I just said, how poop. And <laughs> I was worried about that. I was like, he's going to be drinking salt water or, you know, ocean water and get all, get a bad tummy. And yeah, yeah. So for those, yeah. for the longtime listeners, you know this, but John has had such stomach issues many totally. years ago. And he, the, the fact that John on a triathlon, which could be so hard to keep it down on the run has made this much progress is just like fantastic. Like really That's cool, great. John. Oh, yeah. one thing I forgot to mention on the bike. I used a kit that I had never used before uh, for the, the right. And like, that's oh my goodness. No, no. Um, Luke McKenzie, who's like a triathlon legend uh, from Win Republic. That's his like kit company. Uh, he was the one that, that he was like, I wanted to buy their kit and they didn't have it um, in stock. And he's like, I'll have one at the race and then we can just do it then. So that was one of the best kits I've ever worn in anything across nice. the board, like zero chafing, zero wow. uncomfortableness, which is saying something for being in the TT position for basically the whole time. It looks really good. And it's crazy arrow too. Like in terms of the, it's really good fit. Um, it's the Did Luceo, he... the Win Republic Luke. Luceo is what I use. L-U-C-E-O. Are you sponsored oh. by Luke McKenzie? No, not sponsored by Luke McKenzie. Exactly. So is that... <laughs> it's super cool to meet him though, because like, I don't know, he's, he's kind of yeah. like a legend in my mind is cool. Do, so. do you, uh, so are you saying it's more comfortable than cycling kits? Yeah. And that's like, uh, it, I don't, I want to yeah. use that chamois on cycling stuff, right? Like I want a thicker yeah. chamois, but I want them to make the same two in one style skin suit because it's just like the two and the good two in ones with an open front. Hannah uses them too. And stuff mm -hmm. I see there's yeah. a really comfortable way to do it, but it was so comfortable. Um, and but it was does great it go down to, to the too. elbows. Yeah. There's this, goes down okay. To... That's faster. Everyone, the, the, I know for a long time it was the tank top, but yeah. going down to your elbows is, I mean, smooth out the wrinkles, but it is measuredly faster. Yeah. And it was covered in salt because I sodium loaded. I did 1500 milligrams a night. So one thing I found in Cape Epic, I did 1500 in training for it. And then in the race, 1500 milligrams before the night before uh, through precision hydrations thing, their high one. And then in the morning I would do another 1500. And then throughout the race, I would follow a normal sodium loading plan, which is like, you know, somewhere around like 300 or so. And that I, my kit was just covered in salt, but I never once had a cramp either with this, which was great. Uh Hey, and I just want to praise John one more time. I'll let you take it. Um, so John, usually in all the other races, it's just like, ah, yeah, but like he destroys everybody. This John has, has had incredible deficits, right. On, on triathlon. And yeah. you can see how, why John is so good in mountain biking mm -hmm. where he came on the podcast later on this with his motocross, but you can see the the issues that John has, he attacks them and specifically goes against them or, um, he has like a systematic approach to get better at it. And it sounds like John doesn't get discouraged. He might be mm -hmm. a bummer. does get discouraged when bad things happen. He looks, this is an opportunity to improve and I learned something and then I'm going to make adjustments for the next time. And that 100%. mental state I think is why John is so successful in mountain biking over time because he was already amazing when he joined the podcast. But I bet you if we went back to his beginning motocross days, it would have been the same process and that same mindset. 100%. Yep. Good Absolutely. Job, yeah. Thank you. I completely echo that. I think, Jonathan, I think you completely crushed it. I think this is amazing. I think, um, yeah, I think this honestly goes full circle all the way back to one of the first questions we had today about, you know, you're not going to podium. How do you find motivation? Well, this is it. Look at the way that he broke it down. He made process goals. He made performance goals. Um, that's amazing. So now yeah. the question is what's next? And what are three things, uh, top three things that you'll change in training to improve next time? 
Yeah. So uh, probably, not, is there a next time? Are you doing more try? Yeah, <laughs> for sure. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to be like a one try a year guy, I think one to two a year. So I mean, I think I'm going to do Xterra Lake Tahoe again this year. Uh, nice. I think it won't mess up my training too much. And as of now, what I'm planning on doing, I'm so excited. I got my mountain bike built last night and like mountain bike training. It's going to be fantastic. Um, but on Fridays I have that day off and I like recently I've been trying to find ways to manage anxiety in my life better. Um, cause it's just like mm -hmm. affecting a lot of different areas of my life in a really negative way. And I never in my life set aside time to relax ever. And one yeah. of the things I'm doing on Fridays is I'm doing Friday afternoon swims. So like I'm going to train in the morning and then in the afternoons, I'm going to an awesome pool. That's not far, like from our house in a beautiful area. And I'm just going to lay down. I'm going to chill and I'm going to do a swim and I'm going to chill and lay down in the sun like a normal human. And it's going to be great. So I'm still going to swim once a week. I'm going to do like 2,500 to 3000 probably in terms of distance on those swims. Um, and then I'm going to still run for 15 to 20 minutes. Wait, I want to, I want to go in right there really yeah. quick and just say, I think that is such a great idea. Not only do so many people not include time for rest, but I love that you're pairing the rest with the swim, um, which is something that gives you anxiety because I, th I think I imagine that it'll teach your brain an association of, oh, I go swim. And when I swim, I also get this beautiful time to rest. And so yeah. hopefully it becomes this positive association for you. That's my hope. Uh, that's what I'm going for. <laughs> so, and I don't want to lose swimming. So I'm going to do that once a week. And then I'm going to run for like 15 to 20 minutes at a time, two times a week. And if I do that, then I won't lose this sort of thing. And I'll be able to do exterior Lake Tahoe probably, but I won't do another half until next fall of 2024. Um, I want to train when I can, when it's not freezing and I have to go find an indoor pool option here. That's like really a pain in Reno to find good indoor pool options. Um, whereas when it's summertime, we have outdoor pools that are not crowded. That would be great to use for that. So yeah, that's the plan. Can I share just some really quick thoughts that motivated me though, to want to do another race? Um, mm -hmm. if I had average transition time, it would have dropped my time from five Oh seven to five Oh two. And that would have brought me to 28th place instead of 34th. That's not that big, but it's something I can improve. But if I swam at my pool pace outside, which I think I can drop my pool pace a ton still, I'm at like 133 if I'm swimming 2100. Um, right now is what I did before this race. And I call me, uh, overzealous or something, but I think I can get down to one twenties in the pool. Um, I, and I think it's totally possible. Like it's, it's a technique. It is, John. You, can can do do it. It. you can do so it. So if I had my pool pace, I dropped off uh 14 minutes. That would brought me to the 21st place. If I did that and then I have my typical bike fitness, it would have brought me to seventh place in my age group. And then I don't know, these are all what ifs and everything else, but and then if I had done all this and then I had ran, like, I think I could, if I had really good training, I think I could have averaged 630 for sure. That would have brought me to third place in my age group. So that tells me that like, cause I would love to do a triathlon and be fighting at the front, like a, a half Ironman. That would be amazing. I know Oceanside is really hard. It's like one of the most competitive half fields out there, uh, for age groupers, but still, if I can, I think that's within reach to get within top five and so that's super motivating. So that's, yeah, I'm going to do one again, probably in the fall. If there's a race that you think I should do in the fall, let me know. Um, of did you enjoy it? Yeah, I did. I did. Honestly, I get a lot and I don't want to like glorify suffering or anything else, but I get a lot of like, um, satisfaction from going up against something really hard and mm -hmm. like, and going through it and accomplishing a lot. And that's what I felt like I yeah. did that day. Oh, it was immensely satisfying. Like I loved that. I think any listener to this podcast has that same feeling of uh -huh. that's what we do is like the feeling of accomplishment and doing something awesome. And to what Hannah said, this is why triathlon is so cool. Cause most everyone, it's a race against yourself. What can mm -hmm. I accomplish? What can I do? How hard can I push myself? You push yourself harder on the bike next time. But I would say so proud of you. Like he got 34th in the, it was like what, 200 people or something in your age group or. Uh, 255, I believe. Yeah. That's 255 is age group. 34th, second triathlon ever. A swim panic, nine minute T2 uh, or T1, almost 10 minute T1. Uh, that That is, <laughs> I, I can't tell you how that is so good, John. Like that yes. is like 34th. I don't, I've, I have done a, a, a 458. Uh, half though. So Ooh, nice. Yeah. Nice. <laughs> so I gotta be that. That's the new goal, new benchmark. That's, that's, but that was a completely flat course. That was New Orleans. So it's not comparable between the two. And you, yeah. my first, my first half was Oceanside and I did six hours. That uh, run course is harder than I thought it would be too. 
mm-hmm. like mentally hard. It's really straight and really long. Um, yeah. So John, this is amazing. Uh, we're really proud of you on that. And your run, you. his run was a 133. A 133 Speedy. half by itself is fast, much less after, you know, b- b- panic attack and then uh, <laughs> the the bike. And I, I really think the bike you can go, that's the one that I'm I'm hoping that too, as your kid gets older, um, uh-huh. amazing. Uh, too, the uh, other thing, John, we can talk about afterwards, but with my experience with anxiety too, um, with Trainer Road, we have good health insurance and I have a uh, MD therapist so she can prescribe stuff, but then deal, um, you know, do techniques to reduce anxiety. Uh, there's like these inner child techniques and stuff. All of that stuff helps so much, everybody. And you can just, um, meditation too. How I heard of it is like, if you have a scar or something, or like a, a, a scratch in a piece of wood, it's sanding it down. So over time it sands it down and sometimes it's just going to go away. It's not going to be one time, but it can lessen and lessen and lessen and lessen. And the amount of like joy and happiness of your life that comes through. Um, I've noticed like, I always like raise one shoulder, which is a, a anxiety response when I'm around people of like trying to protect your neck and I'll notice it and be like, Oh, I'm always raising this shoulder and I'm trying to drop it. And <laughs> I wasn't even aware of that until this last year, but I think I've done it my whole life. So these, I'm just so all the guys out there, because I know therapy with, with men, we think that something's bad. Call it a brain coach. This is your brain coach. Yeah. going to help you get your brain on. We all need brain coaches. We do other things mm-hmm. that we get coached. Trainer Road's going to coach you for uh, all of this. Hopefully we can, you know, from afar coach you on some t- tactics and techniques, but get a brain coach for yourself. Good call. Mm-hmm. The last thing I just want to say is uh, thanks to fan or like friend of the podcast, Nick Goldston. Uh, I didn't have family there or anything else. It was just me solo. And Nick was there at the finish line, like, and, and helping me out and chatting with me. It was just awesome. And he mm. was like with me all week too. Uh, not with me. He had a lot to do yet. He was still setting aside time to chat and to support. It was super cool. Awesome. And it's so cool to meet so many of you out there. I met tons. Um, it was great. Um, pretty cool. People yell at you on the course ever. Anyone recognize you on the course? Oh yeah. 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 Like positively. Yeah. The, the vibes on that course are insane. It was so oh, cool Two. This is another one. That's awesome. The vibes in, I know he's like the vibes in triathlon. Amazing. Everyone right? is so kind. Like Bernie it's, man. I heard Everyone's one like, person. I love you. I heard one person be mean the whole time. Everyone else was like amazingly encouraging. And it was so hilarious. The They're one ready. guy that was mean, we were on the second lap of the run. It looked like they were just onto the run and he, somebody passed him on the right. And by the way, like at that point, when you're way back with all of us age groupers, that run is a scrum. Like you're surrounded by people. People are passing on the right and left. And why can't like, you pass on the right on the run? I know. So he goes, <laughs> he, he yells in there. He goes, Hey man, you pass on your left. Is this your first day? And I looked over and I kid you not. Guess what his kit said? It said some sort of town cycling team. And I was like, he's the only roadie here. And sure enough, he's the one that's being mean. Everyone else is so happy and kind. So to me, that Hannah. was just a defense mechanism. He was, he was probably upset, cracking right? so himself. tired. And he was just <laughs> mad that he was getting passed in general. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Hannah, is that is that a rule? I've never on the on the on the bike, yes. But on the run, you pass anywhere you want. Yeah. Yeah. I've never heard that as a rule on Maybe the run. It's his first day. I mean, between I us, we, sidewalk. between Hannah and I, we have one world championship <laughs> and like, <laughs> like, so we know what we're talking about. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It was great. It was awesome. So, uh, I'm glad we saved this to the end of the podcast. We went long on it, but if you enjoyed that and you got some takeaways, hopefully it was great If you're listening to this podcast. Now you're watching it on YouTube, give it a thumbs up. That's going to make more people find it. Subscribe to our YouTube channel, go rate the podcast and rate the trainer road up. That's the sort of thing that you can do to help us. And we're looking forward to talking to you next week. Take care, everyone. Good luck this weekend, Hannah. Thanks. Yes, good, good luck, luck Hannah. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>